Heavenly Father, today we put on the full armor to protect us against attack. We put on the belt of truth to protect against lies and deception. We put on the breastplate of righteousness to protect our hearts from the temptations. We put the gospel of peace on our feet to walk in your light, peace, and freedom with the Holy Spirit. We rebuke anxious thoughts. We take up your shield of faith for protection to block and destroy all the darts and threats thrown at us by the enemy. We put on the helmet of salvation to cover our minds and thoughts, reminding us that we are children of a mighty king. We are forgiven, set free, saved by the blood of Jesus. We take up the sword of the spirit, your living word, that has the power to demolish strongholds and is sharper than any double-edged sword. We come to you, Lord, in prayer daily. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. What's up, you guys? Welcome to The Imagination. I'm your host, Emma, and today I'm honored and excited to have back on the show again one of our favorite guests, ex-Delta super soldier assassin, human trafficking and satanic ritual abuse survivor, writer and author of the book Snatch from the Flames, podcast host and content creator at Nathan Reynolds on YouTube, devoted husband and father, international speaker, entrepreneur, farmer, military veteran, Linenite, Millenite, and animal horn weapon of mass destruction maker, Nathan Reynolds. If you missed Nathan's prior episodes we've done together, I'd highly recommend going back and listening to them as they are all filled with a gold mine of information. But in the meantime, here is a quick recap of Nathan's testimony to catch you up if you're new here. He was born into a multi-generational incest-based family through the Reynolds bloodline and from birth was systematically abused, mind-controlled, and mentally fractured to keep his abuse compartmentalized with the amnesic barriers. It wouldn't be until later into his life and into his marriage that his suspicious past would begin unweaving and unwinding itself, revealing a layered double life checkered with deceit, betrayal, pain, torture, and horrors beyond comprehension perpetrated on him from the same family, military, government, and community members that should have been protecting him, but instead were partaking in what Nathan has coined radical intelligent evil. A regular on the show, Nathan has covered a variety of topics so far, from his testimony to healing to some really deep Q&As that he's done into programming and what he went through as a child into leaving the network and family he was born into, and even an amazing roundtable Q&A with two other badass survivors that aired recently. In searching for a topic to discuss this time around, I put out some feelers to all of you on what you guys would like Nathan to talk about, and I was sent a plethora of amazing questions that covered a variety of different topics. So instead of focusing on a single topic today, we are going to do somewhat of a random Q&A and flow through some of these amazing questions you guys wanted to pick Nathan's brain about. I'm always super impressed at what you guys come up with, and Nathan was super stoked to get the opportunity to answer some of your questions in hopes that we can all continue to learn, heal, and shine a bright light on what has been hidden in the darkness for far too long so we can, as Nathan says, set the captives free. If you haven't yet purchased or read Nathan's book, Snatched from the Flames, I'd also highly recommend reading this incredible memoir he created for all of us. The value in this book cannot be understated, and I promise you it'll leave you better than it found you. What tried to destroy him didn't have the strength. We have so much to learn from warriors like Nathan, who are still here, smelling of smoke, snatched from the flames of radical, intelligent evil. I will have all of Nathan's book links in the show notes. You can find the book to purchase on his website and on Amazon. You can get the free audio version read by Nathan himself on his website and his YouTube channel, and you can get the free PDF on his website as well. It is a must read, and I do not say that lightly, you guys. Before I finish introducing today's guest, I wanted to give a quick reminder that if you are a survivor or whistleblower who wants to share your story on the podcast or who wants to share any information privately with me, you can email me at imaginabetterworld2020 at gmail.com. I'd also love your support on my new Substack, where I'm taking up journaling as an outlet for me personally to reflect on the podcast guests and the love of my advocacy work. And you can subscribe to me there at www.emmacatherine.substack.com. All of my social media links as well are in the show notes, you guys. And I can't thank you all enough 
for caring so deeply about every testimony and every guest featured on this podcast. So you guys, without further ado, please help me in welcoming today's guest of honor, survivor and whistleblower, man of God, voice for the voiceless, absolute warrior, passionate pursuer of truth, and mine and your brother in Christ, the one, the only, Nathan Reynolds. Nathan, thank you so much for being here again with me today. Emma, it's an honor to be here. Thanks so much for having me. Absolutely. I'm pretty excited for today. I didn't know what to expect with the topic question uh, feelers that I put out, but I was super impressed with what everybody suggested, and I'm pretty stoked to get into all of this today. So I wanted to start on a certain topic that I myself have dealt with in certain ways uh, online in a very minor version of some of of things that that you've gone through on such a big scale, but also a topic that I think prevents a lot of people from even speaking out to begin with. And that's the fear of, you know, the handlers, controllers, the ways that society even tries to put a muzzle on people who speak out. And as someone like you, who's really wrangled yourself away from everything that was holding you captive, you know, I wanted to pick your brain on that and talk about, you know, even what is a handler, what is a controller, what is the purpose of, of their role in a survivor's life or at the time victim? Um, and how does that, how does that transpire to continue in your life even after you leave the network and just, you know, any insight that you have on this topic, I think would be really valuable for people. Yeah. I mean, the, one of the fundamental basis is to what a handler is, is somebody that's first of all, someone that's bonding, like the, the, the foundational crux of the entire situation is, is bonding through, it it can be through pleasure. It can be through pain and it can be from release. You know, there's, there's lots of different ways that people are patterned and bonded to a handler early on. And so like I had so many different forms of handlers over throughout my life that the 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 in the the I mean for me it was just a fundamental brokenness early on with attachments that like I didn't know and identify who my mother was in a strong and powerful way. There's in in like a cult kind of families. There's these like other they'll call them like other mothers or cult mothers to where a child is kind of taken from one mom to the other and like relationally bound to different moms and so that there's like a destabilization of what should be natural forms of attachments and so that way it causes them to have totally inappropriate understandings of what boundaries are with what when proper attachment should take place and this this sets the precedent up to where that that child can really bond very unnaturally with any kind of person that fits a a kind of an archetype and so that was like fundamental to the early formative years of like trauma and and mind control is like really dealing with shattering of of normative attachments that's a fundamental crux to it but a handler in a lot of ways is just somebody that 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 person trusts and is bond, bonded to it relationally in such a way that they they want to do what pleases that person they want to do what what makes that person care about them you know like things that they find value in and things that they find to be beneficial like whatever their standards and morality are they're going to try to meet and uh, and match that and so a lot of times the difficulty with separating yourself from somebody who is a handler is that you're you're literally it's like a those same feelings for those of you who have not gone through this that you felt when you first went through a really difficult breakup period the emotional stages of grief that you go through whether it's denial and anger and all these different like feelings that you have like as if somebody died those all start to like come through and percolate through because there's a there's a bonding that takes place psychologically and a lot of times sexually like it's a a physical addiction and a sexual addiction and it's that same kind of neural pathway that gets attached through and so when you start to separate that this is not even dealing with the spiritual components or the demonic components that may be going along with it just physiologically it's it's a heartbreaking period of it and you can have especially with split personalities you can have parts and personalities that have been kind of eager and desiring to get away from that person who have suffered abuse at the person's hands who have experienced the other face of that person but when it when it's that just all in gripping like love bond that's like suddenly broken it's brutal and so for me honestly like one of the fundamental like things i try to talk to survivors i have a lot of survivors that reach out to me that are that are still like one foot in the door with their with their handlers their abuse Users, they're cold and they're they're trying to like get out of it and you can tell there's there's that inner war going on still there's still like a desire to still maintain some level of of relationship because they still see him as mom or dad or as uncle or as friend or as boss or 
as lover, they still see that as that. And so that lens is not really fully saturated through. Like it, it took me really having to see my family, going to my family and being like, you know, this is what happened to me. Like trying to seek and offer forgiveness to them and then seeing them go through the same methodologies of suppressing me when they were trying to muzzle me and keep me from talking to my sister specifically about it. And when they were trying to keep me from talking to specific, as soon as that took place, I knew like, it's like when somebody does says, I'm going to confess what I've done. And they confess 98% of it because they're saving face from that 2%. Like my, my dad did that. He's like, yeah, I know grandpa abused you. I know these things happen. I'm sorry. But like he didn't address the other 2% of unbelievable, radical, intelligent evil. And then outwardly, when, when it started going out a little bit further, then it was turn and mock and scoff and character assassinate and it just uh, this unrelenting barrage. And that's that's that part where the person you were bonded to turns to become your adversary. That's really difficult because on one side, they're going to continue to like bombard you. And one of my biggest, strongest advice, y'all, stop communication with them as quickly as possible. I just can't stress this enough. Like it's it's called the extinction effect. All right. Like when a teacher wants a classroom to shut up and she tries to yell at them, it doesn't help. Right. It's a loud, chaotic environment. But when she just stands there silently and does nothing else but stand there, that's like that's called an extinction effect. When you just use your silence and your abstinence to be the declarative statement for you. That's the approach that I have found to be the most effective when dealing with people who are trained soothsayers. These are people who are like deliberate neuro-linguistic reprogrammers who know how to push your buttons and psychologically manipulate you to get you to come back to them. It's like how do how do how do people go back to their exes who are abusive? You know what I mean? It's the same that's that's a handler. Okay? It's just it's not the guy who's waving a watch in somebody's face and doing hypnotism, but it's the same exact methodology. It's somebody that's weaponizing neuroscience. They they know how to mess with people's minds and get them to come back. And so like my family patterned this early on with these like letters that like during during abuse and during trauma, they did something that was called return to sender programming. They were obsessed with this early on, especially like formative years. So like three years old to six years old to nine years old kind of phases. They 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 have a lot of letters, like um postcard, like postcards from different countries, from different places. And then the other thing is like Christmas cards, birthday cards, stuff like that, and and in envelopes. And so when you're going through the programming back when you're a child, they show you these things, and then when you see these things, you're going to come back to us. When you see these things, you're going to call us up. When you see these things, you're going to come home. When you see these things, you're going to know that safety is found in the family. Just come back to the family. Come back to the family. So like that starts that patterning in you like for later on. Should you ever break out of your programming? Should you ever try to get out of the cult? Should you ever try to get away from these abusers? This is stuff they start to flood you with and, um, and just bombard you with. And so like literally I had to – I had to first of all – I had to have Chelsea screen my mail. I was like, honey, I can't even open the mailbox because on the letter, they would open it up and they would have all these different letters that were capitalized and lowercase or numbers written at different sizes and angles. Like all of this is like literal programming that people put in there. And to a normal person, it may not look like much. It just may look odd. But to but to this person who is subjected to that, that's their trigger words. That's their trigger phrases. That's, that's how they're drawing you back in. They'd be color coordinated. I used to have stacks of this, y'all. Hundreds of these that my family sent over the years of just this onslaught of it and stuff from like the 90s, stuff from like the late 80s and 90s. And it was just this bombardment of all this stuff. And if you if you take that stuff, y'all, and you open it up and you start to it, look at it again or read it again, it's designed to bring you back in. And so extinction is one of the best things you can do. Like I changed my phone number. That was one of the greatest things I could possibly do. I had to still live at the same address. So that made it very difficult. But as soon as I was able to leave, I was really, really important to me to not have to feel that, that constant omnipresence. Like, for me, there was also this online persecution that took place on my comments, on my videos and on my channel, on even like my Amazon reviews on my book. Like if you go back to my very first reviews, these were just filled with my family and my handlers. Like you can see their names in there, y'all. Like I don't, I don't list their names in the book. You know what I'm saying? Like I don't, I don't detail who they are. I try to protect. That's not because I'm trying to protect the guilty, y'all. I'm trying to protect. There's a lot of innocent people still plugged in there. There's a lot of victims still in there, y'all. And I'm trying to reduce collateral damage because I understand there's reprisals that take place against them. Now, everybody that does the abuse is still accountable. It's not me that that inflicted that upon them. However, I try to do my best to protect those that are totally young. Like there's a lot of little children in my family. There's a lot of sexually abused, traumatized children that are my nieces and my nephews, people that are fostered and adopted into this. And they bring them in and just keep, keep the agenda going. They feed them into that beast, you know? So 
getting away from that as best as you can is so critical because it allows you the space to breathe. It allows you the space to deal with your own healing. It allows you to do that separate from them. And so it's just like why it's so important in relationships to like cut an X off, like don't have any relationship with them whatsoever so that you can reformat your identity outside of the cult, outside of the handlers, outside of the manipulators. And it's that, that, that same just struggle that you have anytime you're dealing with that feeling of censorship, because these people are there to, to put a muzzle on you. At the end of the day, they don't care about you. Y'all, they're abusers. They are fundamentally, they're manipul manipulators. You don't need them in your life as much as they might be your best friend. It's not reality. And, and it may take time for you to really delve into understanding how abusive, how perverse, how corrupt they actually are. And so give yourself that space. It's one of the best tools that you can have in your arsenal. Going off of that real quick, when you did get people that came after you, after you spoke out, how did you deal with the intimidation and how, how did you keep moving forward despite that? Um, that's something a lot of people get scared of. And that was what I was referencing that I've dealt with in a minor way on my channel are the family members coming out or people that they work with or some type of associates attacking the guest, you know? And so then you look through the comments, just like what happened to you, you know? And, and even when that happened to me, I had a moment where I thought, gosh, should I stop? Like, this is, this is kind of scary that this is happening, you know? And I know for a lot of people, they don't even speak out to begin with because that feeling that it gives them of, of that intimidation and manipulation. So how did you overcome that and keep going, you know, when that was coming at you so hard and probably kind of scary in a way? It's, I mean, honestly, it is scary. It's super scary. Y'all like, there's a lot of very custom catered threats that are going to be driven at you, you know, and it sucks. It sucks. It's a miserable experience to go through it. And like, it's called the scourge of public mocking. You know, like you're going to be made a fool to the eyes of some, there's going to be people who are going to read those comments and you know what, they're going to, they're going to cast their hat into the lot with those people and their perspective. They're going to totally bond with your handlers. They're going to bond with your abusers. They're, they're even being total strangers. They're going to choose the side of perpetrators. And you know what, that's like part of it. And you'll watch some, it sucks. If you read through the comment zones, you'll watch it take place. You'll watch it take place and it's really difficult because there's a side of you that wants to defend yourself. First of all, you want to defend your character. You want to defend your story, your experiences. And on the other side of it, there is an absolute feeding of that beast, y'all. Like it's it's designed to bring you back in. It's designed to create that 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 anger, that that rage, that frustration, and that feeling of of impotency. Like you can't fight back, you can't defend yourself. And so, like you you need to understand you're dealing with like the literal accuser of the brethren. You know, that's literally what it says. The dragon is our adversary, like goes around stealing, killing and destroying, like seeking to find ways to hide his schemes from the eyes of men. Like he, he, his camouflage is people's ignorance. So like if as long as he can keep people ignorant of his schemes, and let me tell you the most important schemes of his entire kingdom to build an army, to try to usher in the arrival of the, the ancient wickedness, like the ancient hate, his agenda is to use shattering of the minds, is to use trauma-based mind control, is to use subterfuge, is to use gang stalking and targeting of individuals. It's to use a, a, a political, socioeconomical, a military overarching like infectious disease to take over the minds and the wills and the emotions of mankind like that's his agenda and like there's nothing more important to him than a militant arm of it there's nothing more important to it than a, than a side that comes in with this silver tongue to just attack people and so at the end of the day like i had to literally stop looking at that comment zone like in the beginning i just i tried to turn my comments off you know and that's not a bad strategy at all y'all that's t that's one of those great tools that you have is to just don't read the comments that's not easy but you have to understand you either go through and you block them all and you get into these battles but i i genuinely believe one of the best positions you can have is abstinence of it don't engage them don't do not have nothing to starve them starve them from the attention because that's what the adversary wants. He wants to make a spectacle. He wants to make a scene. He wants to drag you into this, this fight that at the end of the day is in his courthouse is in, is in his battleground. And you know what? That's not the place where we fight from. We fight from here. We continue to drive on at the end of the day. I knew fundamentally, I just had to keep going. I had to keep going and not get distracted by the snares that these people are setting for you. You know what I mean? Like people may don't, a snare is like a way you trap an animal with a wire that it doesn't know where it is. Like it, it, you, you find, 
find a trail in the woods. I'm teaching my children how to find paths in the woods right now. And I'm like taking them into the forest and teaching them how to, children are easy to teach this to because they're, they're low to the ground, right? It's a lot easier for them to see deer trails, especially in the fall after the leaves come down. You can teach them how to walk in the forest a lot quieter than most people. If you go in there with them and you crawl on your hands and knees and, and for the children, they can see all these things that other people can't see. And when you get down in this perspective, you're able to see the world totally differently. And it, I'm telling you, if, if you don't stand up and experience this barrage of the chaos, when most people look at a forest and they just see this wall of thorns and thistles and black poison ivy, and they're just like, oh, I can't go in there. But if you, if, you, if you stop looking at all of that stuff and you get down and you just drive on, you ignore all of those other things and you focus on this little path that's ahead of you, that's your duty. You stay on that path because there's only one narrow way that's going to get us out of this. And there's only one job. At the end of the day, I know but my, my reasoning of being here is to be a forerunner, is to be somebody that cuts a trail for people. Like That's why I do this. I'm doing this so that sooner or later, y'all willing, my family will see this stuff as it is and have nothing to do with it and cast that evil aside. And then they'll have a clear highway that's been paved ahead of them to get them out of there, you know? Great answer. I really appreciate that. And hopefully that gives people on the other side some hope. You know, it is scary. Like I said, I was even affected by it. I had to, I had to call a couple of people, a couple of other survivors that I knew had dealt with it. And I'm like, what should I do? Should I stop? And they're like, no, keep going. Like, that's the whole point. They want you to stop. And I was like, oh yeah, I guess that's what I talk about on my podcast, isn't it? Um, so I really appreciate you ask, answering that. Um, I'm sure that that's something a lot of people deal with, whether or not they're public right now or not. Um, keeping on the same topic, I had a few questions regarding targeted individuals. So this could be somebody who is gang stalked. This could be somebody that uh, believes that they're being targeted with directed energy weapons or frequencies, um, targeting uh, really of any kind. Uh, but those seem to be some of the main ones, the, the directed energy weapons, gang stalking. Um, I wanted to see if you had any insight on that or if you've dealt with any of that. Um, I know a lot of people do. Um, and I, I definitely believe that these things are real. So I'd love to hear your insights. Yeah, for, I mean, directed energy web. I talk to a lot of people that are TIs, you know, they call themselves TIs, targeted individuals. And they reach out to me a lot because it's super distressing beyond your worst nightmare, y'all. Like uh, if you can, for a second, imagine that there is people who do their job is to destabilize somebody else. That's it. Fundamentally, the, the whole entire basis of this is a form of trauma-based mind control that's utilizing like exterior agents that are not detectable to the people that are around them. It's it's so disorienting because now this can happen for somebody that is a whistleblower. Like you, Emma, host a lot of people that are whistleblowers. They'll experience a lot of gang stalking and they'll start to be, experience what it's like to become a targeted individuals uh, at corporate size events. Even people that are trying to come out against a corporation, something that they saw unethical that was taking place. That's where a lot of people first get exposed to this. I'm not just necessarily talking about people that come from like occult families and covens and all this other stuff. This takes place on a, on a military scale, on a political scale. It can it can take place for all kinds of varieties of reasons. And what a lot of that will look like on one side of it, you have a, a directed energy side of this, this is like microwave weapons, people that are hitting people with with ways of targeting just the body tissues, this this layers underneath the skin to heat it up. Like there's there's something that's called the LRAD, which is like a long range acoustic device that's used by the military that that heats up a layer of un, uh, just basically the water under your skin just a little bit and it can increase it over time duration and intensity and all this stuff it can do it through line of sight there's others that can do it through walls and when they start to do this stuff it causes extreme burning discomfort and so this is one of the most common symptoms of people that are experiencing targeted individuals is they feel like they're being burned they feel like they're literally like somebody is is torturing them and there's nobody in the room with them this isn't like a demonic attack this isn't like a necessarily like people coming in and doing rituals and sending spirits and dark powers and that kind of stuff we're talking about like a technological side of this and this is technology that's been available for decades one of my uh let me share screen this with you because i have this this is a um this is a really good book it's a pdf you guys you don't have to like buy i know i talk about a lot of books y'all books are amazing okay i'm just saying like i'm super shockingly obnoxiously biased to books okay but um let me just pull this one up and screen share with you. Here. Let's see here. It's, oh, it said you disabled it. Oh, it says you disabled it. You got to give me a chance, Emma. Give me a chance. I'll do fine. Okay. I'll give you one off. chance. Let's see. Okay. Try it now. You get one chance. <laughs> so there we go. Okay. Here we go. All right. This is uh, This is a book. So even just one of the things I was researching earlier too. 
Because I'm trying, I'm trying to help people, y'all. You know what I mean? This is like it sucks. It sucks. People are literally having their lives torn out of their their flat. They're like their entire life is totally destroyed. They're 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 taking their sleep. If you take people's sleep long enough, after a couple of days of just not being able to sleep, every time you lay down to sleep, you feel like you're being burned alive. This is uh this is like army manuals that deal with it in the USSR. Like this has been going on a long time. This is the hold on. Let me just show you guys the book here. It's on page 13. We'll get back down to it. This is called Monarch, the New Phoenix Program, which is edited by Marshall Thomas. And uh, uh these are some of the issues that they go into. Um, chapter one with war crimes, Phoenix program, new Phoenix program, behavior modification. This is fundamentally at the end of the day, all of this targeted individuals is dealing with behavior modifications. They're trying to cause people to change their current behavior. And that's through all of these, these tactics and these strategies. And so um, they go into there's a few different chapters in here. Let's see mind war. This is a big section on it. Uh, patents and spinoffs. There you go, guys. Chapter 16 on existing laws dealing with targeted individuals. This is a really good resource for those of you guys that actually want to study this out more and find ways to be more effective at understanding street theater. This is where you like people when they go out of their house, they will literally have people where everybody on the street that they will bump into just mean mugs them, just looks at them as if they're a monster, just makes them feel like like everyone is out to get you. And it's like it can totally freak you out, like totally freak you out if for the next two weeks. Every time you went out the door, there were big, scary looking people that just looked at you as if you were the worst person ever. That's just one level of it. Okay. But they go, they go into here, like in persons of interest in army intelligence have been in charge of non-lethal microwave weapons development for the army since 1980 and worked at government weapons labs like Los Alamos, where the atomic bomb was invented in secret. They have expressed interest in using non-lethal weapons to modify human behavior and neuter people. They have publicly advocated using electromagnetic weapons, EMW, to attack civilians in their homes. Some of them have been instrumental in moving the classified military weapons from the DOD, that's the Department of Defense, to the DOJ, that's the Department of Justice, and into the hands of local law enforcement and others' use against domestic enemies involved in domestic disturbances, which is vague enough to mean anyone. None of these intelligence officers and, and physicists are superstitious or believe in borderline ideas they promote. The superstitions like remote viewing are a smokescreen by army intelligence to cover up the development and use of electromagnetic weapons. These men are experts in psychological warfare operations with 45 years of experience in the art of misdirection, subterfuge, and counterinsurgency warfare. He goes into a lot of the formations of these different technologies, their tools, who use them, the FBI, the CIA. And he goes into how a lot of this was used for mind control operations, how to modify people's behavior. So this is like on one side of it, just a really good resource, y'all. I, I have in my uh, in the description of this below, I'll definitely have a link for this. And Emma, I'm sure can drop this in hers as well, but well worth your time. One of my absolute favorites. I've been going through this book because, or this, yeah, this book for a little while now because it's just full of so many different topics. They also go into CIA's creation of satanic cults. They do, they do a, a great job with so many things on mind control and assassination teams and torture teams, all that stuff. It's a really fun and spicy book, but on one point of, of my experiences, the first time I ever experienced kind of becoming a targeted individu individual was also like I downloaded something called Tor, which is like the onion router, because I wanted to access certain uh, websites because I knew there was caches of information that are hidden out there for people like me that go through secret training. Okay, there's ways that you can access stuff that you, you stashed away. You want to make like a, a cache of information in case you get blackmailed people start coming after you like what was happening to me. And so I needed to go there and access it without having any fingerprints to that. Well, once I downloaded the onion router, I started experiencing gang stalking. Like I literally, when I leave my house, there were people like Chelsea and I would go to this grocery store that was near our house. And there was these guys dressed up in suits that looked like six foot four linebackers with pistols, obvious pistols bulging under their jackets who would just stand and like anywhere we went, if they went to like the end of an aisle, they would just be standing there just watching us. Like we went to check out, they'd just be standing there staring at us. And then there'd be one posted like near our car. And it was just this like presence of like, we're watching you. We're watching you. And it's just, it's that destabilizing feeling like in the cult and the coven neighborhood, like on the, the video, the first channel that's posted on my YouTube channel, y'all is, is literally the documentary of secret plutonium weapon sites and, and, uh, child sacrifice. And that was dealing with the Jessica Ridgeway case. We had an active coven that was taking place there in, in countryside neighborhood in Westminster, Colorado, that was slaughtering and sacrificing children and butchering children. And it was crazy infested place with like, there's a lot of secret government military workers there because there's a, 
There's a Broomfield Airport that's right there, a regional airport that does a lot of defense contract work for the United States government. And so there's all kinds of spy work that's happening there. And their families live in that neighborhood. So there was a nasty interconnected ring with military intelligence and people that were part of the occult and people that were part of the Church of Satan. It was just like a nasty little network in there. And so when we came out and we're like coming out against this stuff, we started installing security cameras. We are watching these people in our neighborhood coming onto our property and dropping chunks of flesh. Like they were like butchering animals, butchering people, and like dropping that stuff on our in our driveway and in the yard. And then they were, they were putting USB thumb drives in the neighbor's mailboxes and stuff. And these people were buying and trafficking child porn. It was crazy, disgusting time to be in there. But you would have this omniscient, present feeling that like, we know where you live. We're going to cause you pain. We're going to cause you suffering until you come back to us or you stop doing what you're doing. You know, And it's that, that constant anguish. And if you destabilize people's sleep long enough, man, it makes people go crazy. It really does. And it makes it just compounds that effect. And so I do believe... There is a very serious spiritual component that does also have to get addressed a lot of times, but that is just on on the physical side of it. A, a just a, it's a hell. It's an absolute living nightmare that so many people deal with. Uh, the guy I did an interview with that's called the House of Dragons, Fire Medic Eight FM Eight. Um, he he deals with a lot of that and helps a lot of folks in dealing with that. Talking about it because he's experienced a lot of that. He was a whistleblower against uh, all the death cult stuff that was going on back during uh, the lockdown period. Oh my goodness. It's really fascinating the ways that have been found and discovered and uh, utilized to torture people, you know, and I think the the TI targeted individual side of things, it's sort of a less talked about aspect of this abusive system. I think because unlike say physical abuse, sexual abuse, you know, you can sort of point a finger and say this person did it where with electronic abuse there's really not like there's not an abuser that you can point a finger at you don't it's like an invisible abuse you know that that the person experiencing it suffers from but other people you know it's hard to validate that with other people so you speaking on behalf of that really does validate it um there's not you know i think the ti community too there's a lot of them suffering right now not a lot of ti's are out there actively doing podcasts too um, so I think that's, it's, it's awesome that you were able to answer that. I had a lot of people, you know, reach out and want to know your opinion on that. Um, mm -hmm. sort of keeping on this topic again, I have another question regarding speaking out, which says, I would like to know any advice he has about survivors going public. Would Nathan have done anything differently when he came out with his testimony? I like that question. And I would have tried to get as much evidence as I could while I was still in. <laughs> I would have tried to stay a double agent a little longer, but I was, I was full. Of this, I was pretty scattered. I was, I was struggling. It's really hard to like, when you first come out, you first start speaking. There's so much, it, you have like program deniers inside your system. If you're programmed multiple, like you've got parts of you that are literally only job is to deny everything that happens. And you'll see this happen with survivors when they come out and they'll start sharing their testimony. And then unfortunately their handlers or somebody else triggers them. And then they come out and they just deny everything and disappear. You know, it's, it's really, it's really gross, but that's literally deniers. Like some of you are wrestling with denial right now. And you're like, you, you might be seeing counselors talking about this stuff for months or years. And then all of a sudden you're like, there's no way and you're like, it's, it's okay. There's like, there is a massive counterinsurgency inside most people to not go out and be public. There is like a very orchestrated intentional design to keep the secrets. And that is fundamentally at the end of the day, what, why your testimony is so powerful because your testimony supersedes their secrecy. And that is there. You cannot build a house in secrets. You can't, you can try at the end of the day, but it's not a house. It's a prison cell. You know, like that's, that's why prisons exist because there's secrecy, there's compartmentalization. And that's the, the core structure of, of program multiples is secrecy is like, you're not allowed to know this information. You're on a need to know basis, but the truth is your testimony and sharing that is, is your weapon. Like it really is. I'm a huge advocate of people coming out and speaking their stories, coming out and sharing their testimonies. Like I have people that reach out to me and they'll write me very detailed experiences of their testimonies. And it's very, it's very painful to read it. It's very hard to read it. But at the same time, I'm an, I'm a massive advocate of that and I'm, I'm very welcome to it, but it's brutal for me to go through that stuff. However, I'll write back to them. I'll try to write back to them as much as I can. 
And a lot of them never respond. A lot of them just wanted to get it out there. Like, I know that's something you shared with me earlier, Emma. Sometimes they just they just want to share it. They don't want it shared publicly necessarily. They just want it out there. And that's like a very powerful and important part of, of releasing a lot of the the bondage of shame, a bondage of like secrecy is like you're 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 literally getting outside that door that has been so deliberately placed there, this kind of demonic, dark energy that's that's held your your mouth closed, that's muzzled you for so long. But if I could give any advice about people is is being really deliberate that when you do come out that you understand that yes you're going to suffer persecution likely because of that you're going to suffer some levels of reprisals because of that but it's a good thing like the the points we were just talking about earlier like that may be exactly what you all experience maybe you don't maybe some of you guys are able to to speak out without that but understand that like it's going to toughen you up it's going to it's going to make you a warrior on the battlefield of this information war awareness is a key fundamental component of this because you don't know how many other people who saw or witnessed or around you and experienced a lot of what you experienced and there's nobody else on the face of the earth that they could ever relate to or understand that has a testimony or a lifestyle that they went through that you do and when you release that when you share that out man it cuts people the bindings off of people it it it, it literally unlocks the the doors of the bindings of shame it frees them from the bitterness and frees them from the self-hatred. Like I can tell you, it's it's so empowering to me when I see other men come out and talk about sexual abuse. Like it really is. It really is. That's it's you're denying shame. It's it's power over you. You know, like if I could go back and do anything differently, you know, I uh I don't know. It's it's brutal. It's brutal to come out here in the public arena. It's brutal absolutely brutal but because i've been in there i mean i've been speaking out for six years now i i it's beautiful it's beautiful because i get to see the fruit of it i get to see that like it's worth it there's there's people who have written me their lives are completely different like they're they're free or their children are protected you know like it broke the cycle of abuse for a lot of people and i uh i'm alive they're alive and as long as you have your life, as long as you have your voice, like use it. Don't don't let them don't let them win by your silence. Cause honestly, silence is the thing that fuels their kingdom so powerfully. But if you break that silence, if you come out and you speak the truth, if you speak the secrets, there is life waiting for you. Like there's life in the truth. If you lay your foundation in truth, it is absolutely incorruptible. That's the rock we're supposed to build our house on. That's the rock we're supposed to build our lives on. And when you do that, you break that cycle and you give you give another generation the opportunity to know that, you know what, there's a great cloud of witnesses. There's these faithful people out here who can validate and verify what it is you've gone through, what you've been through. And you know what? They can't kill us all. Fundamentally, they can't. We're multiplying every day. Like the truth is always more infectious than the lies. Love that. Always so inspirational when, you know, you get on these topics. I love that you share from your heart, Nathan. I know that it inspires a lot of people. And these are really good questions. You know, these are, you know, legit concerns, like being nervous about doing something, you know? So for people on the other side to hear that you were also nervous and that it's still hard for you, you know, helps people feel not alone in, in their own suffering, because you know, that it is a real, uh, thing to discern. It's something to consider, you know, but also seeing on the other side, you know, the safety that it provides, that there are good things potentially that can also come from using your voice and putting yourself out there, you know, even just, uh, you know, if one person hears it and their life has changed, like how you were saying, Nathan, all the outreach that you get from people who are so grateful, myself included, that you put this content out and that you put yourself out there knowing what you're risking to educate people you know, and, and again, I know everybody's in a different space in their journey, you know, but for people who are speaking out, that's one of the big things I also hear is, is it creates a barrier of safety too. Cause now people can see you, they have eyes on you, you know, it's not going to be as easy for people to mess with you, at least not without, you know, a fight going down on the other side. So I appreciate you answering that and, you know, helping people who are in that space, ready to go. They're just hesitating because it, it's really nervous, you know, and, and nerve wracking and, and fearful. And it's beautiful to see all the roses that you, that have bloomed from this, you know, you planted seeds and planted a garden and I'm sure it was really, especially really hard at first. And I feel like more than ever now, you know, these, these seeds are blooming in people's minds and so many more people are being exposed to this. And then there's channels out like yours that are educating people on it, you know, where a decade ago, it was a whole different story. So 
so happy, Nathan, that you decided to do this. And, you know, everybody who has come on podcasts like mine and who are speaking out, you know, and, and if you're not to just know that, you know, it's possible for you if you keep on the journey and, uh, you know, take the advice of people that have, that have come before you and done it. Um, I had another great question that I want to segue into regarding speaking out and somebody saying they're wondering how you avoid questioning and legal issues with the crimes that you've witnessed and admitted participating in when you're speaking out. Well, they just, nobody's asked, you know, I don't know that I've necessarily done anything to try to avoid it. I've literally been like an open book. I'm like screaming from the mountains. So I haven't tried to avoid any aspect of it. I've welcomed it. I've sat down and talked to some of the best FBI interrogators, people that are consultants for the FBI that work with state police and interview and interrogate big, bad, scary murderer people, you know, people that do polygraph tests and people that have sat down and examined me for my testimony and my story. They weren't doing that in a official capacity. You know what I mean? But they were grilling me like crazy. So I've had some of that stuff happen. I've had, I've talked with us marshals. I've talked with police officers. I've had a lot of cops show up at my door because I lived in an RV. That was not the way to get away from cops. I learned that the hard way. I had more encounters with police knocking on my door in the RV than I ever did in my life. So that gave me a huge, that used to be, I'll just say, oh, that used to be a huge fear of mine, like a huge fear of mine. I got to go back in my head just for a second here because it's easier for me to think about all this stuff from the lens of which, which like I'm at now and like years and years and years down, I used to be terrified that I was going to just wake up one day and open the door and there was just going to be SWAT, FBI, everyone, just all of them, you know, just surrounding the house, that kind of feeling. And, uh, <laughs> one, one time, but I really believe you've got to kill your fears y'all because at the, like you have to, like, you're going to get what you fear. Like it's a real thing. Like you literally get what you fear. It's not like some kind of like ethereal reality. You are going to get what you fear most, 100%. Chelsea one time was like, we moved onto this property and they had a trampoline and Naomi was like three and Jubilee was like eight months. And she literally looked at me and was like, wouldn't it be the worst thing ever if Naomi broke her arm jumping on that trampoline and we have to go to the hospital during COVID? Would that just be like the worst thing that could ever happen? What do you think happened? Like a week later. Naomi breaks her arm. It's like Shabbat. We're like chilling. Naomi breaks her arm trying to do a backflip as a three-year-old on the trampoline. And we, where do we end up? You stinking right. We're in the ER and COVID and all that crap. You're like, no way. No way. You betcha. You get what you fear. It's like a serious thing. That's why like you're, you're told like 370 times in the scriptures. Like don't fear. Don't fear. Don't fear. Don't fear. Don't fear. I have a video that's called Altira, which is the way you say it in Hebrew. It's like, do not fear. Do not be afraid. People will be courageous. Why is he saying that all the time? Because he knows us and he knows the entire like fuel source for the kingdom of darkness is fear, phobias, phobos. It's like this goddess that would break loose on the battlefield, the gods of war. And you're like dread, like you get it. Like it's literally like when you're in a war, it's all it takes. It's all it takes. It's like these minutia of like this, the, it's called a hesitancy, you know, make somebody stutter step and make somebody like hesitate for a second that like panic. They're like, if you take a second gulp of air, instead of pressing the trigger at the right time, you miss your shot and they make theirs. Like the, the, the game of, of, of life is a game of millimeters. I tell this people all the time. Like I love knives because they're precision instruments. Like a, a bullet is not as effective to me because I'm not as accurate with it. Whereas a knife in my hand, I know where it's going. Like I know it's, I know it's, it's, it's actual path. Whereas a bullet, when it enters a body is not predictable. I don't care how many times you've shot something as a target, a static target. People are not static targets. Like they're very, they're very peculiar inside. And when you start going in there with something that's going at a high speed or a somewhat low speed, things do weird stuff. It's really strange what happens when a bullet goes inside somebody and you can shoot somebody a lot of times and they don't die. And it's a freaky, frustrating thing. It's weird, but you get what you fear. <laughs> like, if you have these fears of people coming around you and surrounding your house and doing all this horrible stuff to you, or you getting thrown in prison or you're getting dragged into the courts, like you're going to get that stuff. You really are. But if you fear him, like I fear, I fear at the end of the day, having to give an account for my life. I do. I, ha I have to give an account for what I did with what I was entrusted with. And like, he gave me a lot of talents. He did. He entrusted me with a mind. That's like, it's important to use my mind for good. I could use it for great evil. I could build a serious empire with this mind of mine. I could do a lot of other stuff with this brain. I could merchandise a lot of people and I could make a lot of money with this mind. But, or I could try to literally wage a war for the souls of mankind and try to set the captives free. And so like I intentionally put my mind on that and I don't try to seek out those other fears of men. And like we left a, a farm that we were staying on down in 
Danny's at this farm down in Florida. And I, I had recorded my full audio book and posted that there was like not a lot of views and traction for me at the time, but I still was terrified. I still was really scared about stuff. Anyways, we woke up one morning and I, uh, gotten a big, big thumping knock outside our door. And we had, we had stayed at this campground and I had police all around my vehicle on my RV. And I was like, Oh my gosh, here it is. Here it is. Like it's going down. And they like asked me to step out and they asked me if anybody stole anything because somebody had broken in to all of these RVs around us. And that night in the middle of the night, Chelsea had been woken up in a dead sleep, feeling like something was stalking in the darkness. Like there was something out there and she felt like it was like thievery, like something was stealing. And so she prayed, she literally prayed, like stopped and prayed right then and to protect our things, protect our home, that nothing would, nothing would happen to our home, that they would leave us alone. And literally we're the only one that didn't get broken into everybody around us in that campground got broken into. And it was just like, we have seen literally the father deliver us from our fears. We have seen him literally send dreams and visions to us to like help us get away from places or circumstances and things. We have seen so many miracles happen over these last few years that like, I don't fear that at the end of the day, I don't fear questioning. I don't fear these things because at the end of the day, I have committed myself to tell the truth, the absolute truth and nothing but the truth at any time, as far as it is unto me. Because if I do that, it allows me the ability to understand that like I'm building my foundations on this. My family built theirs on lies and deception and death. Like that's not going to hold up in the court of law. It's really not even as corrupt and as, as absolutely broken as the systems are. That's not the courthouse I'm talking about. You guys, I'm talking about the white throne of judgment. I'm talking about like the day when you have to actually give accountability to the judge of all the earth. Like that's the court that we are all going to be brought into. And I have to give an account there. And so I put my faith in him and I trust him that he can defend me and, de and protect me however he sees fit. You know, and if that comes to trial and you have to go through discovery and you have to go through litigation, well, then you get access to evidence, you guys, that puts this stuff on a validity that they don't want. I think fundamentally they don't want to validate survivors at all. They really don't. They don't want to give them their opportunities to, to contend with them because you're going to have to bring these people who are perverts in front of the masses of people and public records of perverts is not their goal, you guys. They want to silence this stuff. Secrecy is their game. And so as long as they can maintain that ruse, they're going to keep going on that, that agenda as long as they can. Love that answer. And that's really true. You know, like what, what abuser wants to take somebody to court who's accusing them of the crimes that they did, you know, then they have to prove it wrong. So there is definitely a lot that goes into that. Um, I appreciate you answering that because that's probably another thing people fear, you know, whenever they're going to speak out is that exact thing of, you know, people coming after them for what they're saying. Um, and I also know that that's a reason why a lot of guests don't give real names, you know, and also, you know, privacy and safety and things like that of, of involved innocence. But um, I really appreciate you answering that, Nathan. Um, I had a, I love how like a lot of these questions are sort of about these controlling elements. You know, I think this is all the ways that we're muzzled in life and whether that's when we're already out there talking about stuff uh, or not. Um, whether we're close to it or, or knee deep in it. Um, but there's a lot of people also that reached out that were asking about, you know, aliens and abductees and the military abductee programs and getting freedom from that. So I don't know if that's something that, that you've experienced or know about, but I wanted to touch on it just because some people wanted to know, um, wanted to get your thoughts on aliens, UFOs, uh, and the military abductee programs. And if you have advice for anybody who may be suffering or, uh, you know, being tortured by these programs. Hmm. Yeah, I, I, I was doing this uh, work at a treatment house in Boulder, Colorado. It's called AIM House. And we had this red pill group. I mentioned it before, but. It was like a group where people could ask any questions and a lot of them wanted to talk about aliens at the time. <clears throat> there was a guy I used to listen to uh, a lot of guys, LA Marzulli. I don't know if you guys have heard of him, but he has a book or a series of videos, documentaries and stuff called on the trail of the Nephilim. And this guy, Steve Quayle and Timothy Alberino and Josh Peck and these people at Skywatch TV and these news, man, I was all into the alien study and stuff. I spent a lot of years just saturated in that. He had a book that was uh ETs and the Vatican, um, Exo Vaticanus, I think was the name of his book that Tom Horn, he just died recently, but Tom Horn, they have a lot of really good resources and uh, um, Cherubim, oh man, 
yeah, I lost the name. Josh Peck is the author. Okay. And it's called like cherubim chariots or something like that. But okay. I, I fundamentally, I believe on one side of this, you're dealing with Ophanum. Okay. Ophanum is like a class of spiritual entities that are chariots. They're like, you go back to Ezekiel on these like wheels within wheels and these visions that he sees of these chariots flying around, you know what I mean? And he's looking at trans-dimensional stuff. He's looking at things that are like, not just in one realm. He's looking between the realms of multiple dimensions. And so he's seeing these compression of like face of a man and an ox and an eagle and a, and a bull. And he's seeing all of this compression of space and time all at the same time. And that's because there's a, there's a distortion between time when these Ophanum show up. Okay. And they are generally like uh, orb bodies, right? They're like literally what a lot of people see as these like balls of light. These are literally the bodies. I, I believe on one side of it, I'm not going to talk about military tech side, just hold on. We're going to hold our hats on that side. We'll get there. On one side of it, there's these physical beings that operate in a spiritual and physical realm that are like literally the vehicles for these entities to move themselves around with. Okay. And they are literally called in the scriptures, Ophanum. Your, your Bible may not say that word, but that's the word. They just don't use it in English very often. That's literally these beings that are, their, their job is to carry stuff around. Their spirit is in this wheel. Like that's literally their nefesh. Their life is this, is this vehicle. So on one side of it, I believe that that is literally what people are dealing with and some of their encounters, their experiences is that they're dealing with Ophanum. They're dealing with these spirits that have a physical corporal body that's a vehicle. That's all they are. And so they are carriers and can carry inside them other beings, other, other spirit beings and other physical beings. And so on one side of it, you have to deal with that equation and trying to sort through whether or not you're dealing with that side component of it. This is why when you go to places where there's a lot of dark activity, like um, people that do ghost investigations and people that are going to like battlefield sites, people that are investigating, you know, poltergeist activities, when they take pictures, they take videos, you'll see these balls of light, these orbs of light. That's the, the things that you're dealing with. You're dealing with some of those entities manifesting. So on one side of it, you have righteous ones that have not rebelled and have not like fallen and left their righteous state that are carriers of messengers, angels moving around in between our realms that, that could be detected, could be seen. They could be coming to do good things and righteous things. And then you have another side, you have fallen sides, you have fallen cherubs, you have fallen Ophanum, you have fallen seraphim. These are the different classes of hierarchies of, of rebel angels, messengers, Malachim, these, these beings that have rebelled. Okay. They are ones that also have partnered with human agents on this side of the realm to reveal to them technological components of this so that they can design and build their own art, their own craft for this. Okay. And this goes back to like a lot of this. If you go back into the Nazis, you go back into the 1930s and you got to go back actually to the late 18th century, late 19th century, early 20th century, when there's these societies from like Theosophists and these other ones that real society and people that were starting to impart a lot of this knowledge, this gnosis from what I believe are the fallen watchers that were released, the watchers that had sex with women and left their heavenly estate, like he talks about in the scriptures, and mingled themselves with men, gave birth to giants, these Nephilim, and their descendants after them. They are the ones who reveal a lot of these secrets to them. And one of the fundamental secrets that they reveal is technological information on how to make weaponry, warcraft. They teach them secret sciences like that. And so at the fundamental base of the kingdom of darkness is a war. They want they want weaponry. They want advanced weaponry. And the way that they do that is they trade human assets for it. So they trade physical women children, people, humans to be tortured, abused, traumatized, consumed, drained of their life, uh, turned into slaves. And that's literally a, a legal exchange. They swear an oath in order to do that. They, they swear binding those and contracts with these other beings that might appear to them as all kinds of stuff. There was a book that was called uh, They Walk Among Us. I can't remember the author. Maybe you can look that up. <clears throat> there was like a whole book series we went through all we we started. So in that red pill group, we started reading all of these different books, right? I was like, okay, if you guys want to talk about this stuff, we're going to read it from multiple different angles. We're going to read it from a totally secular view. We're going to read it from a Christian view. We're going to read it from, you know, a military view. We're going to look at it from all the different angles, because I think what it does is it helps to shine the light on the topic that is otherwise pretty gray. And so if you, as you start to examine that and you start to read abductees account, because I, I can't say their name, but I had a client there who was uh, from a very powerful family in New York. He was suffering from abductions, okay, as long as he could remember. So from when he was a child, he would lay in his bed. At night, he would have this paralysis. He would have this just complete paralysis over his body. A bright light would shine into his room, and he would be levitated out of his bed and taken outside of his house, and he would be taken into a craft, and he would have experimentation done on him, okay? He suffered from trauma. 
physical trauma, psychological trauma from that for years of his life. His testimony is not something that people should just discount because it's not in their realm of normal. At the end of the day, he physically would wake up in the middle of the night screaming. I used to do night watch there and he would scream. He would have night terrors. Okay. That I believe on one side of it, you can be dealing with somebody that's dealing with sleep paralysis. That's a literal spiritual attack that's taking place. Okay. I, I recommended to him to read Psalm 91 out loud. Like I have seen people who suffer paralysis, abduction experiences, have it stop at the name of Jesus, at stop at the name of Yeshua, like stop it, stops it, which shows me that there is a legal hierarchy that's still in play, even when you're dealing with something that may be technological and spiritual. I've seen, I, I've got to see survivors of abductee experiences have deliverance from those same encounters taking place and they stop when they start to have power encounters with the the judge of all the earth. Like so it tells me there's there's two major components of it. Sometimes you're dealing with physical aircraft, physical agents, man-made agents and assets, and other times you're dealing with spiritual ones. So you've got to kind of ferret through a lot of that to be able to get to the root of it because people are experiencing great troubles at, at night and in their sleep. And I, I lived in an area that's very, very famous um, outside of Snowflake, Arizona. And in Sholo, Arizona, in an area that had a very famous encounter of these beings that were coming there. And I was there on the Apache reservations where people were doing rituals to try to get these beings to come there and open these gates. And other people that were in the town that weren't participants in this stuff were, were talking about UFOs, having sightings of UFOs, while at the same time, I know my family and well, not just my, my bloodline family, the coven was specifically opening doors to try to get these spirits to come in and give them divine powers and give them rituals of downloads of information. So like, I know for certain there's overlap between those realms where people on one side are experiencing Experiencing this affliction, and I know it's spiritually based, but I also believe, yes, a lot of this is also unidentified aircraft that people just have no understanding of. There's drones, there's technology, the Liberty Bell. There's all these stuff that's been people, dark sciences, the X projects. There's a guy who's called the Dark Journalist. He's uh, got a YouTube channel and other other platforms. He deals with a whole lot of the technological side of this for the pro X class projects uh, over history. That's a great series if you guys want to go investigate that further. Thank you so much for answering that. That's that's always sort of a controversial question too, or topic, just like the targeted individual, you know? So it's, it is really, that's been something really fascinating to me to learn about is just the different perspectives on the alien UFO and understanding that a lot of, you know, what we're introduced to as the public with this technology is stuff that humans actually have access to, you know, and how far ahead technology is underground versus, you know, the iPhones and computers that society sees. It's so, you know, just uh, above and beyond anything. I think if you haven't seen it, if you're somebody that is wondering about this, you know, it's probably hard for, for you to comprehend this type of thing. I know it is for me too. And whenever I hear about stuff like this from you and other survivors, it just blows my mind. And I can't even imagine how far they are now you know, this, a lot of the stuff that I've heard was from, you know, whenever you were a child or other people were a lot younger, you know, and to think about where they're at now with some of these technologies that could be around us, you know, and, and then feeding into the, the TI program, the frequencies and just all these different technologies that we, we just have no idea about. So it is really fascinating getting to learn that from you um, and hearing a little bit more about that. Um, I wanted to talk about a different type of I guess, muzzle in a sense, which would be more of the demonic attachment side of things, the familiar spirits. I had a couple questions about that. And one in particular, hearing your perspective on Satan's army and demonic attachment and DID individuals. Um, so wanted to sort of open that up to you because I think that's also an important topic. Heck yeah. Which one of those do you want to launch with? Let's start maybe with the demonic attachment and DID individuals and your thoughts on that. Hmm. The, uh... Well, this was like actually one of the last books Russ Dizler published. It's called Expelling Darkness and Engaging Non-Human Entities Now and in the End of Days. If you guys email dizdarbooks at gmail.com, she's got a lot of the – she she had a lot of these available. I just talked about it on the SGT report, so it may be blown up pretty good. But he deals a lot with dealing with demonic attachments in DID. 
in his series of, let me just show you guys another website here. If you guys want to see a lot, if you actually want to get into the minutia of a lot of this, let me just send you to a better website that uh, has a much deeper resource on it. Shatterthedarkness.net. Let me share a screen here with you guys. This Great. is uh this is his website, okay? And he has he has a training courses in here, all kinds of stuff, okay? This is from his main website, shatterthedarkness.net. So if you go down in here, he has a series in here that's called Freedom Encounters, okay? Basic course on healing, deliverance, and restoration of ritually abused SRA and MPD. So there's a lot here, y'all. This is like a more almost like a counselor's level course of, you know, 25 different sections. And a lot of these are part twos and threes and all this stuff. But he goes through an incredible amount of detail in discussing how to deal with demonic attachments in DID. But at the fundamental core of it, uh, so there's there's that for you guys. Dive in there. You could you could spend 45 or probably more hours dealing with that. When a mind is split, and it's all about the will. At the end of the day, everything that is dealing with abuse and trauma and DID is about an imposition of someone else's will on your will. And so demons fundamentally are the disembodied spirits of the Nephilim. We've talked about that a little bit earlier. They don't have a corporate body in this realm to be able to engage with their lusts. Okay, They are always hungry and never able to be satisfied. They're always thirsty and never able to drink. They can't physically enact their desires and their wills with their own bodies anymore because they're bound in between the spirit realm and the earth realm. And so they're stuck here. It's like a prison planet for them, y'all. Because of that, they're looking for skin suits. They're looking for human agents to be able to occupy, to engage in these activities, to enact their lusts. That imposition of their will on mankind is what drives so much of this dark agenda because they want physically to enact the will of the of the, that ancient hate upon the hands of men. They want to raise up an army. At the end of the day, that's that's their fundamental deep desire is to raise up an army that is going to to wage a war against the son of righteousness. That's that's where it all is driving to. It's Revelation 19. It's like the son of the son of man coming back that white rider on the white horse, when all the earth's armies are gathered to wage war on him, he literally has to build that army early on. And so the shattering of the mind, the deliberate destruction of someone's free will is fundamental basis to all DID. You, you have literally a gift from your creator to help you to survive impossible things. No one should have to experience trauma and abuse, ongoing destabilization. No one. But we have a gift that allows us to dissociate it, separate ourselves from that. But when you do that and you create a fresh personality or blank slate, when you when you have that and you have a uh, sexual trauma, abuse, rape that's taking place during the course of that event, there is a spiritually transmitted disease that is so often brought in intentionally, invoked. Like you have somebody who is trained in that to bring in a spirit to enforce the programming, to to hold captive that individual. Like people, a lot of times, I had a survivor share a story of of that recently who I did an interview with, and like that they had a door in their mind for like throughout their life that they just this horrible black door. And every time they thought about it, they were like almost sick and they could not get through it. And it was years and years of, of seeking intimacy with the father and a relationship with him and like developing maturity before they were able to actually look at the door with the Messiah with them and realize at the end of the day, it was like the door was literally a demon. The door was a demon that was keeping them from seeing this memory. That's that's that was put there by design, but during the course of the abuse, that that demon is there to try to keep the person from coming to the truth. That demon is there to try to hold the trauma in place. They want to hold that trauma in. If you have the spirits that attach to the person, it allows them to be able to control them and hold them in that bondage for a lot longer. It's horrible. And it keeps them from coming to the place of freedom because they they hit this wall of resistance, this this internal tremor like that that doesn't want to get out. And so like there is a major component that requires strategic, deliberate deliverance. Okay. Like it requires expelling that demon. It requires expelling that stronghold, a strong man that's inside them, binding it and casting it out of them to give them freedom, to give them restoration. Because otherwise you don't know sometimes if you're dealing with a personality or are you dealing with a demon, you know, and it's, it's sometimes very messy and it requires discernment. There is a chapter in here that I wanted to read from. This is on page uh, 226 it kind of captures just the fundamental basis of it it's in ephesians 2 it says and you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the age of this world and according to the prince of the power of the air 
the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. Among them we also once lived in the lusts of our flesh, doing the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But Jesus came to destroy the works of the je- devil, 1 John 3, 8. And that includes his power and ownership of you. Look at Colossians 1.10 and see that you were once under the rule or dominion of Satan, but you have been taken out of that and been transferred into the rule, power, and protection of the kingdom of Christ. You are now a child of light, and Ephesians 5 gives you a great unveiling of it. Read Ephesians 5 and see that you are now in Christ and a child of light, God's light. And because of that, you are now commanded to expose the evil deeds of darkness. Here's part of the goal of your salvation. Satan power expelled from you. And now as a believer in Jesus, it is our goal in evangelism for others. As in Acts 26, I now send you to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. True salvation is ground zero for expelling darkness. Satan's works, rights, and influences off, out, and over us. You are what you are now. This new life is detailed all in the New Testament as a relationship with God in Christ. To see what you are and have in Christ, you can do a quick reading of Ephesians 1, 2 Peter 1, and look at how often 2 Corinthians 5. It all begins to reveal this new life in Christ. Therefore, if any man is Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. Look, all things have become new. All this is from God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ. This fundamentally, it requires like a renewing of your identity. And even though like on your core, for a lot of people, even if your core identity is a strong believer, is already understanding of a lot of this stuff, or somebody that's not, you have to deal with expelling that darkness out of them in order for them to be able to enter in to restoration of identity. And so I... That's why, like we've talked about before, Emma, I don't believe you can really get total deliverance without an identity restoration through through the Messiah. Like he is the judge of all the earth that has the authority to actually drive out these spirits that are far more powerful and smarter than any of us. Like don't ever think that these immortals can't smoke you psychologically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, physically. These things can tear you to pieces, y'all, and they are very, very good at doing all kinds of stuff to make you terrified. So like when you're dealing with survivors, when you're dealing with people that that are another personality comes forward, sometimes this demonic horde comes forward with them, and it's absolutely destabilizing. It's very scary if you've never dealt with that stuff. If you don't have any experience in spiritual warfare, you better stick and learn it really quick because if you want to enter into this field, you're going to be fundamentally interlocked. Like people that are being physically and sexually abused get transference of horrible demonic strongholds that come into their life, and you've got to be able to engage that stuff and deal with that stuff because they need healing. They need restoration of their identity. And so once you can drive out that demonic, you got to give them a restoration of their identity, their purpose, because so much of that imprinting is just, I'm a guardian, I'm a runner, I'm a sex slave. Like that's all I am. That's all I'm ever going to be. And so you have to restore to them a new purpose, a new identity. Like you have to literally help them understand something so fundamental that that's not all you were made for. That's not all you were here for. So you have to eradicate those lies. You have to eradicate that deceit and you have to bring them restoration of the truth, bring them restoration of a new purpose. Great answer. That was a really good question too. It's it's fascinating learning all about this. And let's go back to familiar spirits, which essentially are, you know, spirits of dead people. Um, I'd love to hear any insights you have on that. The person that had wrote the question said that she had experienced paranormal experiences as a child that felt very demonic um, in that way. And she was inquiring about the familiar familiar spirits. Um, and maybe just some advice on how to, you know, rid your life of those also. You know, you said familiar spirits. I'll just say two things. First, first off, familiar spirits aren't necessarily just like you can have dead ancestor familiar spirit side of it. But like I would look at familiar spirits more from a lens of like generational curses, mm. generational spirits that have been like the, the the guardian over the family demonically or spiritually, like principality over the family, like my family's principality over them is death. Like that's literally the the familiar spirit that my family operates under. That's the the inherited, the multi-generational God they serve is death. So like that's where their covens are. That's who they're like, that's their boss. So on one side of it, that you're going to have an overarching like family spirit that's going to rule and govern over you, your family and, and direct 
you generationally. You'll see there's a stronghold of alcoholism, people will say. They're like, there's some kind of genetic problem. It's not a genetic thing, y'all. Like these are these are literally family spirits that that come on and are passed down. Like why there's there's incest going generationally is because that's literally one of the family spirits that is passed down. So <clears throat> on one side you can be dealing with, yes, spirits of dead ancestors are are one thing that you can look at. But I generally think that most people are actually dealing with is not uh is not that they're dealing with their actual family's generational spirit. That's like the one that's been on their lo- their bloodline for a long time. And it, it, I, I'm a huge advocate of people breaking and renouncing their curses of generational curses of Freemasonry and of breaking of any of these oaths that family swear, because part of that is um, here. I'll share another. I'm sharing another website. Hold on. This is a real important one. They took this one down, but I found it. <laughs> oh, Suckers. I got you. Here, <laughs> let me show you this one. I got this. Uh, this is on my website. It's also in the description of every one of my videos now because I'm like, you go get them, y'all. This is a book someone handed me. They printed out this website. <clears throat> this is the Wayback Machine. You guys rock for whatever, whatever good that is. Anyways, uh, this is uh, Freedom from Generational Curses of Freemasonry. This was compiled by Isaiah 54 Ministries. That's the website that got taken down. But this is this is not a joke, y'all. This is like you want to engage in some serious kick in the teeth spiritual warfare stuff. You better deal with the generational curses that have been spoken over you and your family forever. Because this in this country, y'all, this new Atlantis that you live in, it's not the Amer- United States of America, the corporation. Like you live in the states, the United States of death. You know, like this is the land of the plume serpent. That's the god they serve here, and they are. This land was built to to give them the freedom of religion to practice occult workings. It is not for you to be able to say what you want to say about truth. It's so that they can say what they want to say and do all the wickedness. That's it. You'll see that at the end of it, this this nation was established to bring forth Luciferians. At the end of the day, you'll watch and see the fruit. <clears throat> Anyways. They they have a legal right when they when they go through these degrees, first degree and second degree. This is the renunciation of that, by the way. This is like your weapon against that is is repenting for it, saying like I no longer agree that whatever my great great grandpa, whoever the heck he was, said about all this stuff and cursed my family line and and agreed to all these things and it's not going to say this stuff. These are the the specific renunciations of those different degrees as they ascended through this this inverse pyramid of poison. They started swearing stuff specifically to curse their generations, their their genealogies after them. Okay, they're cursing that, and when they're doing that, they're imbuing, they're calling upon a familiar spirit to be placed upon their their generational line. And so this is based off of these are like the breaking of it because you say this stuff. I'm not going to read any of this stuff out loud because it's freaking disgusting. Anyways, <clears throat> Shriners, thirty third degree, all other degrees. It goes through all this stuff, and it's not just Freemasons. He deals with Druids, Foresters, Orange, Elks, Moose. Moose and Eagle Lodge, the Ku Klux Klan, the Grange, the Woodmen of the Wild, Riders of the Red Robe, the Knights of Pythias. There's so many disgusting, the, the Knights of De La Mole, the Knights of Columbus. Y'all, there's so many just infectious, filthy perverts out there with all their like man, boy, love, child rape associations and all of their disgusting, sycophantic pervert stuff. Anyways, fundamental basis of this, they curse their generations to the third and fourth generation by committing iniquity. That's like open, continual, ongoing rebellion. They like incur the curse, okay? That generational spirit, that familiar spirit then says, takes the blessings, the generational blessings that should be on those children to the third and fourth generation and then gives them to the to the person swearing the oath. That's why that person gets rich. That's why that person has all the connections, the health they live to 100 years old. That's why they're so blessed. Whereas then for generations, you'll see this utter horror show following them. Like why some people are like, my life just never, ever goes well. Because a lot of people are dealing with specific generational curses that's being enforced by the familiar spirit that was put there by their great uncle. You know what I mean? Like this is a legal right on your bloodline for this spirit to come in and torment you and steal from you according to what they've already given away. And so when you renounce those things, you're breaking off, you're cutting off that power source and you're binding that familiar spirit and casting it out. It's also a major like it's a major changing of the guard. Like you're gonna be, you're gonna have to deal with. You need to replace that with with blessing. Anytime you bind anything in the spiritual realm, you need to loose something else into that space. Like loose the Ruach Hakodesh, the Holy Spirit, the set apart spirit into that place to cleanse it and fill it. Like you need, you need a replacement there. You can't otherwise you're gonna just clean the house out, and then seven worse demons are gonna come in, show up, and beat your lunch. You know what I mean? So like. Don't engage in this stuff. I don't like pray for people for deliverance unnecessarily. Like there's a lot of people I don't pray for them to have their demons cast out of them unless like they're really committed to changing their life because it's they'll be worse off than if we hadn't done that. Like it's not worth going down the road of deliverance, you guys, if you're just going to keep going into that realm. If you're going to keep going and engage in this stuff, it's going to get worse for you. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. And thank you so much for that. I 
I've become more privy to that recently. I had never understood, you know, even generational trauma. That's something that I think is new for a lot of people even watching the show just to understand how that's passed down. But the curses, the stuff that might not be as a identifiable, right? Like you could have somebody in a family that maybe never experienced a lot of trauma and has had a pretty, you know, great life. But like you said, there's just all these little things that might go wrong or they might have relationship problems or whatever it is. There's something in their life that just, you know, something doesn't click ever. And they're thinking, well, what's going on? What's going on? You know, being able to take that high level perspective And to say, okay, well, I might not have contributed to whatever's happening, but what in my bloodline may have that I'm carrying, you know, and to realize our power and cleansing ourselves from that, you know, and and that there are people out there who have been privy to that and who have created these awesome resources to help us with that. So thank you for sharing that too. And that was on the Wayback Machine, you said? Yeah, it's on on my website under recent. Resources as well if they go to snatch from the flames.com and the resources yeah, that, that links there that too we got to show people your website upgrades uh sometime during this podcast too oh, it's yeah. so awesome what you've done yeah i've got a couple hundred resources in there <laughs> <laughs> it's, great. it's awesome so you guys can just go to nathan's website and find that um i'm gonna read another inquiry that somebody had she said i want to hear more on the reptilian aspect the serpent seed change the change and what is done for it you want to speak on behalf of that? I would say, well, first of all, I've talked a little bit about, I don't use the word reptilian, y'all. I'm, I'm really pretty pretty adamant that these things are dracon, like these are dragons, you know? I don't think they're just lizards. I think they get a, they get, they got a good branding campaign out there to call them reptilians. They are dragons. People fundamentally cross-culturally forever have understood a dragon is not the thing in that, that is not the thing you want to be interacting with in the same way. They're known as tricksters. They're known as deceivers. They're known as beguilers and they're known as ravagers. Like they bring luck and fortune and all this other stuff and foretelling. But you know what? At the trade is fundamentally those same things that we were talking about earlier with these fallen angels. Seraphim are, are like serpentine in nature. They were like a, the divine being that are the ones flying around Yahuwah's throne saying, holy, holy, holy is Yahuwah Elohim Almighty who was and is and is to come. They're these like multi-winged ones, but they're very serpentine in nature. And because of that, when they rebel, like they get cursed with trans, like transfiguration in the most horrible kind of way. They go from being these beautiful beings of light to these most horrible looking creatures, grotesque, grotesque, awful looking things. I'm not dealing with just the physical, like actual dragon side of, of reality here. I'm talking about like the beings that get cursed and sent down onto the earth and inside the earth in order to live as a, as a form of punishment. <clears throat> There's a literal seed line of those beings as well. They have children, they have offspring. Okay. And they are literally sons of the dragon. They're literal sons of the serpent. Like this is why Yeshua says in Luke, like he says, like, behold, I send you out and I give you power to tread on serpents, dragons. And lions, like he gives us power to tread on these things. The scorpion, you shall trample underfoot. This is why Psalm 91 is such a fundamentally powerful scripture because like you, he literally is giving you the authority to tread on even this level of deity, these monsters that are literally under our feet. And the reason they live down in these subterranean places is because they're persecuted so heavily when they're above the ground. They are they are hunted down because they're obsessed with bloodshed. They live off the blood of people. That's because in the garden, Adam, <clears throat> Adam's punishment was that he was from dust. He was created and the dust he's going to return. He's going to work by the sweat of his face until he dies in order to eat bread. The enemy, the adversary, he cursed him. He took his legs off of him. He took his ability to fly around and be this beautiful, magnificent being. And he cursed him to crawl on his belly and eat dust all the days of his life. He's cursed to eat dust. And what is man? We are dust. This is why they're obsessed. They're literal fuel source. In order for them to have interactions and survivability, they they physically drink and consume the blood of mankind. That's why there is people who are willing to make deals with them. Go down into the underground spaces like this is why Hitler and had all of his little secret occultists going out all over the earth, scouring the tunnels and de- building deep underground military bases and going out into these the Tibetan societies. And they're trying to have access to what he believed was the Vril, that as they were called, like he wanted to be able to talk to these beings that are said to live under in these underground subterranean cities. Now, they're real places. We're going to talk a lot about more of this next week when em and i are doing a show with with uh, a couple other amazing mighty warriors but fundamentally they make legal exchanges with these people and as long as you continue and you continue to feed them 
people, human beings that as cattle, as, as a meat source, as a supply source, they give you technologies. They give you mines and metals and, and super rare earth metals like Neptunium. Some of these other really uh, not naturally occurring elements that are around that you can use to build spacecrafts, that you can use to build ships that you travel around in or monorails. Like there's this whole other underworld that operates underneath our feet and that operates because these people have deals with dragons, okay? And so there's there's dominions, there's seeds of the dragon, there's, there's bloodlines of the dragon that are here on the surface and they have the divine right to rule as kings. Dr. Or, uh, Gary Wayne's book, The Genesis 6 Conspiracy, has a great section on why these people are the divine right of kings. Um, <clears throat> the the blood drinking kings of Kish and his section number seven is called the house of the dragon. Gosh, this book is freaking awesome, y'all. Y'all just read books. It's crazy cool. He's like a historian who goes through not just like the the normal waking people's history. He goes through all their occult, crazy, insane histories too, and he gives you just the absolute ex exposition of all of it. It's it's amazing, y'all. This this is the stuff they used to cut people's tongues out for for like long time. They used to kill all these guys that ever tried to do this stuff, or they just bury it in the Vatican's secret libraries. And they're like, you're gonna have it. Well, you can read it now for yourself, and you can understand like what do these people believe? Like where do these fairy kingdoms and where did the serpents and dragons and the Leviathan, and the, the bull cults of Melchizedek, and like what is all this stinking thing of the house of the dragon? Like I grew up in a family that literally believed we were like children, physical offspring, human side of these dragons that like they mingled with women and they had sex with them and they infected their seeds. They have like a parasitic serpent seed that they put inside of people that, that operates within them like a host. I know this is like wild, but they genuinely believe this stuff. Like I'm not even kidding around, you know? And like they, they literally do a ritual where they're infusing that seed into a woman during, during a divine rite, And a dragon looking being comes in and has sex with her. Okay. That's where they then have a, a child that they operate on the surface with. Back in the days, they used to make giants during that process because giants were the kings, the god kings on the earth. Well, now the ty the di the giants that operate are the ones of industry, of intellect. It's a very different form of what they imbue upon them to make them the divine rulers of a society. You make them intelligent. You make them capable. You make them empowered through wealth and prestige and through good looks and these other arenas. Well, that, that all ties into that serpent seed, and this is where – these blue bloods have their divine right to rule. They believe they are carriers of the seed line. That's why, like, I had to, like, it took me a while to break out of that mind game that I was unredeemable. Like, I thought I was unredeemable. In the book, The Gospel to Every Creature, which is good news for Nephilim, transhumans, enhanced humans, and anyone else who is the result of genetic experimentation by John Darnell. It's a really hard book to find, y'all. I don't, I don't have more copies of it beside this one. And y'all willing, I will scan it and get it out there to you. But he deals with, how people who have even come from bloodlines like this, like there's still a desire for free will. There's a free will in there that you can still have deliverance and restoration. And so I could go into draconian stuff for a while. It's a freak show stuff, y'all. But no, they're not lizards. They're dragons. Understand that. Fundamentally, tungsten bullets are great for them. Tungsten bullets, tungsten spears, this kind of stuff, y'all. Lots of it. That's why I have this stuff everywhere. I'm like, oh my God. I'm, I'm adamantly committed that we got to, we got to do, we're going to be fighting Terminator. I don't know why people don't get this. Terminator <laughs> is the dragon who gave people foretelling. He's like, by the way, these are going to be the generals that you're going to fight in your army. So go kill them. That's what he did to you guys. That's why you're survivors. He's like, why was, why was I chosen out of my family? Because he knew you were going to be his most dangerous adversary. So fight, fight, fight. <laughs> Amen. I love how in every episode you have all these different weapons that you just whip out. They're just hanging out next to you. I love it. <laughs> Um, I want to talk about it, kind of an interesting topic. Um, I was happy that somebody asked this because we did an episode on healing recently, and this actually wasn't something that came up, but somebody wanted to all combine sort of two questions because I think they sort of go hand in hand from what I've learned from you. Um, somebody was asking about the black goo, and I've heard you talk about detoxing that from yourself. And another question was somebody was asking about recommended remedies for purging our body of, um, I gotta be careful with what I say here, nanotech technologies that have, you know, gotten into our bodies through shots and chemtrails and tainted food water, et cetera. So wanted to see if you could touch on the black goo and maybe the, you know, the ways that we can detox and purge ourselves from all of these chemicals and, you know, black goo stuff that gets in us. Heck yeah. I'm going to go to a website, y'all. <laughs> yes. Let me just show you the OG. Let me just show you my OG. Nicholson, yes. 1968. Heck yeah, man. This guy, 
no, you can you can dive in here for months. I could just lose you guys for a long time it's in website. here. It's well worth your time. It's well worth an endeavor in here. He has do you do you see what I see is also on YouTube? <clears throat> I believe that's his his channel. But um we'll go into his website right here. Because his major crux that he is always hammering, which is so brilliant, is that the goal of the Antichrist, the anti-Messiah, is to set up his reign in a third temple. That's not some place they're going to build overseas in some desert place. It's your body. He said, the body, behold, the kingdom is within you. Like, your body is the temple that Satan and the beast and the Antichrist want to get inside of. That's fundamentals here. Transhumanism and the insertion of metal mixing with clay is the ultimate, like, kingdom that they're trying to build into so he he's got on here let me see i'll go to his playlist he's got one that's um <clears throat> let's see he's got some of the best stuff i've ever seen on uh the black blue and programmable matter is what i would call it okay here's let's see these are just you can get lost in a lot of these for a long time but what he does is he also takes a lot of like um modern videos and commercials and tv shows and stuff like that and shows you how they're they're revealing this to you and and how this is like fundamental to this but um he goes into – so these are his different videos, and oh, man. Oh, he, he's got hundreds and hundreds of videos. He's been at this for a long time. He does a lot of really good music as well, and uh, <clears throat> it's absolutely incredible. Anyways, Black Goo – I'll just go back in here. Black Goo, he's got one on here that's all on Black Goo. He's got a whole series and playlists on that. I can't find it right now, but I know that you guys can anyways. It's well worth your time. Programmable matter, fundamentally. Black goo, I think on one side of this, you got two two potential equations for it. On one side, it is literally nanotechnology that is that is designed to be a programmable matter so that they can put it inside and make replicants of itself and then take over the host body and be able to do different stuff. In the United States Army, I went through an experimental program where they were like, hey, we want to give you the ability to be run faster and be stronger and, and tough, like a Superman soldier thing, right? They gave me shots, and and in those shots was a vial that had the black goo inside it. And when I stepped off the boat or off the the vehicle when I was offloading into my advanced individual training program, I rolled my ankle severely, like shattered bad. And I I literally went to oh it just makes me cringe. I went to sick call, okay. And the doctor came in and said we've got an injection for something that's going to take the pain away and it's going to give you your strength back in your ankle, okay. And it had this black goo inside it, and literally gave me these injections along my ankle. And all the pain went away, and I was stronger than I'd ever been in that ankle, and I immediately was back in action, okay? Later on in my life, I understood that what had happened was I I took into my body something that was absolutely not original design material. Like, this is something that altered me genetically in DNA. Like, it made me different. It made me different, and then when I got out of the military, it made me dull. Like, it, it was like somebody pushed an off switch inside me, and I was constantly sick. I was constantly like, like I felt like my body was going through rejection of a, of another organ. It was horrible how sick I was and how jacked up I was and weak I was. And so it wasn't until I started going to a counselor and started praying a lot of these renunciation prayers like we're talking about today. Well, I sat there in his office and I specifically was praying and repenting for putting that stuff inside my body, for allowing that stuff to come into me and, and agreeing to it. And I literally prayed that the, that literally the father would would go in. The great physician is like one of the titles for our Messiah. Like he's called the great physician. And I believe he can physiologically go in and separate out what would otherwise be something that's unseparatable. And after I prayed that, I literally had that goo, like a black oil, come out a, around my ankle, like come out around from the sites where there was those injection spots. And it was like a smear, like a greasy substance that came out of my ankle. Nowhere else on my body. I've had other times when I started doing like an actual physical cleanse, a detox. We started taking like a nascent iodine and a Lugol's iodine and when we started drinking spring water. And I had like white milky stuff come out of the back of my neck, like like where at the back of my sweating area and stuff like that. And I believe a lot of that was decalcification of my pineal gland. Like like a lot of this buildup in our bodies from the, the drugs we're on all the time by drinking tap water or drinking a soda or drinking a coffee. That, like you're drinking poison constantly and a lot of it physically affects you in a serious way so on black goo side of it i believe yes it's a technological literal technological equation i've also seen black goo being drunk in ceremonies out of golden chalices and out of <clears throat> human skulls that i believed was the blood of a serpent the blood of one of these dragons like when they would bleed it was this black substance that would come out of them so i've seen that side of that equation that was more like a parasite and so what i don't actually know is is the the version that the military was using, is that just the same thing as what I saw in there? Is it that same parasitic transfer? Or is it this technological side of it? Because I know there are definitely people that are doing dark sciences that are trying to build stuff like this, that they want to be able to program it with a computer. 
But I believe fundamentally this goes back all the way back to Inky and and these these I mean the Sumerians, these people have been drinking this black goo and these black chalices for a long time. And so I believe that is literally like the blood of the serpent that the people are are drinking. And when they drink that, they get this power of foretelling and divination and they're able to see the future. And so they use that during these rituals so they can see the future. But I believe it is a parasitic host relationship. So detoxing side of it, like we're crazy fanatics about that. We just did a video about a lot of <clears throat> not just our detox protocols, but like our normal health regimen. We're like all into the natural cures, y'all. Like I don't want to go to the drug dealers at Walgreens ever again. You know what I'm saying? Like they don't need any more of our money. They all need to go to prison fundamentally. Like that's what all those quarantine camps need to be used for. You know what I'm saying? But yeah. the major detox things that I've utilized that have been super helpful for me is diatomaceous earth, black walnut, that those are like really, really powerhouses for me. Um, trying to think of some of the other ones. Okay, I did a super ridiculous detox. I'll just tell you right now. It, almost, it was freaking insane. Okay, Josh Truex has a protocol that he gives away on his website, Modern Roots Health. I'm going to go to another website. Let's do it. This will be fun. Do it. This yeah. one's more happy, right? A lot <laughs> less dark, a lot less like creepy occultist stuff, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Modern Roots. You're right, though. There are so okay. many ways this that were poisoned. So this is fascinating. It's an onslaught, y'all. You got to deal with it. It's like a multi-front attack, okay? Like, I'm trying to wage a perpetual war on, like, 450 different fronts, right? Like, because we are being, we're just being bombarded in every arena that we have, okay? Modern Roots Life. This is, like, of anybody that I like to support and buy supplements from, like, this guy, Josh. He's he's brilliant. He's, like, savant, smarter than me. This is one of those people, I'm like, when I talk to, I'm like, I feel stupid. I need to read more books. I love being around people like that. I'm like, I need to just get smarter super fast. So anyways, he's got this thing on here. It's protocol info, okay? He's got this right here. Check this out. You can do consultations with him. I highly recommend it. He's he is, he's an incredible believer and he's a wonderful guy. And he was one of the best trainers in the world at 24 Hour Fitness in Vegas, was crushing it. Like could have been making millions of dollars instead, devoted himself to trying to give away a lot of his protocols and his research and shared a lot of this stuff publicly with people instead of just privatizing it towards the rich. So mad respect for this guy. Anyways, this is his protocol. I highly encourage you. You can get this for free, y'all. I highly encourage you to dive into this and schedule a consultation with him. You can talk to him like, and, and dive into it. Now, he has on here, oh, man, detox guide. <laughs> oh, sun lights you up. Oh, okay. This one, this one, I don't know if I can just, let me see if I can just get it for you guys real quick. Oh, man. All right. These little lemons in here. Death in the lemons, man. They're coming for you. <laughs> Here it is. Here it is. Okay. This is the four ingredients that changed my life fundamentally. All right. Maple syrup, water, cayenne, and lemon. Yep. That's it. Okay. He he has this protocol in here, and this is what I did. And Chelsea did last year, uh, last summer as well. She she had lost her sense of smell for, I don't know, 12, 14, maybe 14 years when she was like in high school. She fell and, and busted her nose up and got all these vaccines. You know, all that all my my wife had all these problems going on with her nose and she couldn't breathe and she could never smell anything for a long time, which means she couldn't taste much and means she couldn't smell my farts. So our marriage was sweet. <laughs> but then she did this detox. Okay. And here's what it was. It was two weeks. It's like, a, it's like a, an intermittent fasting thing. And you drink this cocktail. <laughs> They're going to get you. All right. You drink this drink every, every like hour on the hour. You don't mess around. You make these drinks. You have like water. Distilled water is great during a detox and a cleansing. And, and so for the first five days, okay, you drink on the hour, every hour, water, maple syrup, like a tablespoon or so of maple syrup, uh, like a juice of a fresh squeezed lemon. And then like I did, we did a tablespoon, no, a teaspoon. We did a teaspoon of cayenne powder, like 90,000 Scoville cayenne powder. You drink that drink on the hour, eight ounces of water. You drink that, nothing else, for on the hour, every hour for like till like five o'clock. Okay, then you take di like charcoal and diatomaceous earth. He has this break your fast bomb. I highly recommend it. Don't mess around. Activated charcoal and diatomaceous earth or bentonite clay. And you take that and then you wait an hour and then you can eat like a light meal, super light. You don't want to eat meat here. You're going to get stopped up on the worst day ever. Okay, this, this, this is great. Check into that. Okay. It went crazy. I'm going to tell you right now, this detox lasts for five days. And then you have like the sixth day you can kind of eat, eat, eat a light meal seventh day you're allowed to like eat normal okay what happens is cayenne juice cayenne pepper when it goes inside your body it's like basically almost omniscient it is as close to like the most powerful potent little plant inside you and so when it goes inside you that spice most of you who are averse to spice it's because your body is super acidic okay if you can't eat spicy things fundamentally like the almost always it's because your body is full of of mucus and inflammation and so when you eat spicy stuff your body's like I hate you don't you ever do that to me again because 
this spicy stuff, it really does go inside your body and it starts to take those mucus and get rid of it. Like one of the things that happens though, is it takes the acid out of your body and it shoots it out your butthole. Okay. That's super hot horribly hot like battery acid literally it's stronger than battery acid so you got to put some coconut oil on your butthole just going to be transparent here because if you don't bro you're going to have the worst case of monkey butt ever you're going to have a rotting red brutal but it's crazy i didn't this is like i'm not gonna be super straight with you we haven't done our detox or die video but you better do your detox or die but you will have if you don't drink this drink every hour like you are going to be on fire like cramps horrible abdominal cramps like oh Oh, crazy cramps because what's happening is inside your body, you're finally giving it everything that it needs to like run and gun and start taking all of these toxins because all of you are so full of toxins. Like if you, if you have fat on your body, especially like high quantities of fat, those are toxins being locked away. It's not like calories to be burned later. It's like death. Your body literally is trying to save you from death. Okay. So it locks it up like a prisoner and shoves it in its vault and is like, don't touch that guy until we got everything we need to get rid of him. So as you start to do this detox and this fast, your body's like, oh, we can start to deal with these, these, these like living nightmares inside us. And they start to grab those people and escort them out, those monsters. They start to escort those toxins out of your body. So you have these like unbelievable bouts of crazy, insane, colorful diarrhea. And if you're like, you're, you're going to go through this stuff. It's awesome. It's horrible. It's wonderful. And uh, I really highly recommend it. It's fantastic. He has a product on there that's called like Herbal Flush. You can start there. That's like an entry level, like work your way in, you know? It's a 30 day, like a lot more mild thing. Some people, it doesn't even really phase them much. Other people that are super sick, like really, really toxic, they're like, the Herbal Flush was brutal. I've been doing like perpetual de detoxes ever, forever. I have every chance I can, like as long as I've been alive because I've, I've believed I've been full of parasites, you know? Like I watch wiggly, nasty, disgusting, wormy creature things go into my body on a regular occasion. Like I ate super rancid, moldy meat. I ate maggots, all that. I had to eat abominable, disgusting stuff at fundamentally as a part of this. And so I wanted all that stuff out of me real bad. And so like papaya seeds, I used to just eat papayas. We lived on a, a place, a farm and they had papayas. And I literally was like, eat all the papaya seeds. Ah! So I just was like, <laughs> all the time like dan the people out on the farm were like dude you're just not supposed to eat that many they're like eat a teaspoon of it and i'm like eat as many as are in the papaya and sometimes there's like half a cup and you're just like Egh! and they taste like rotting oh they're just bad they're bad but they're great for you and i'm all about the super extreme version i'm like just get it out of me like get it out of me <laughs> these detoxes are fantastic okay they're fantastic you do that for two weeks you're a different person. Chelsea got her sense of smell back, like straight up. She got her sense of smell back. She looks like a different person. Her face was like glowing and radiant. And I'm like, my gosh, you look like 15 years younger. Like she looked like a different person. It was amazing. But she had abdominal cramps that were so bad. She equated it to labor pain at times. Like I had an incident where I didn't get my drink on time because I took these children down to play with turtles and, and by the river. And then I had, I had to run in under an oak tree and just have horrible diarrhea. And I was burning and I was trying to like walk back up the hill. And I had these little children that didn't know how to ride bikes and it was muddy and their bikes were stuck in the mud. And I was all like, oh, oh. like I literally had to send Naomi. I was like, Naomi, go get mom. I had to send her like three quarters of a mile by herself. Never in my life has my daughter been outside of like my field of view. And I was like, go back to mom. Get the, give me the drink. Give me the drink. It was so bad. I was doubled over. And I was like, that was because I was 15 minutes late on a drink. You know what I'm saying? Like, anyways, it's great. For those of you that are looking for some kind of violent way to just turn your life inside and out, I highly recommend it. It's fantastic. And I think it super gets the, the psychopaths out of you. Like, I'm dead serious. Second, other than that, I like cold plunging, cold plunging, you know, like I'm always advocating cold plunging and fresh milled flour and all these other things and wearing linen. These are literal detoxification factories, all that stuff too, you know? Like I, I talk about this stuff all the time, but we haven't talked about the poop stuff. <laughs> it's fun. Have a great time. A violent way to cleanse your body. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> oh my goodness. That's a really good question. People who ask that great job on uh, having some good questions. We didn't talk about that in our healing episode. And that's obviously a big part of healing. Um, and for people listening to just as a side note, starting January 3rd, I'm going to be partnering with Alexia Eisenhower from Ricky Leaks. She was on my podcast recently doing a podcast on basically uh, exercising parasites out of your body. She considers herself to be a parasite exorcist. So we're going to be doing a parasite cleanse as a group starting on January 3rd. And there's a podcast on my channel. By the time this uh, episode comes out, you'll be able to go back and look and she's going to outline what products and uh, we're going to start January 3rd. 
So I'd love if you guys join us for that. Parasites are also a big, you know, thing we want to detox our bodies from. So we'll do it as a group and we'll have a big group uh, parasite detox. So join us in that if you can. Um, next question for Nathan, I had somebody ask, and I've had this asked a lot of times. So I wanted to just ask you, I don't know if you have any ticks or tricks or tips on this, but somebody was inquiring about how to find out more about her bloodline. And I have gotten asked that too. And I'm a little bit lost too on where, where to start on that. I know a little bit about my family, but thought I'd maybe ask you if you have any resources or ways people can do it without donating their DNA to the government to get, you know, some information back. Don't give your DNA to the Mormons. Just no 23 and me. They're all lying. I'm saying, I'm just telling you, they're lying to you. Don't you dare go believe in anything that any of those results say. Like, I know you guys think that like, I know my ancestors now. No, you don't. You know whatever the heck they wanted to tell you. That's it, fundamentally. They're all liars. They're looking for the sons of the serpent. That's it. They don't care about any of you. They really don't. They're looking for freak shows out there. They're looking for their children of the Nephilim. They're like, we want another beast of the, the Antichrist system. I'm dead serious. You know, it's like, I know I'm satirical right now, but it's like literally what they believe. Like they're literally looking for like the children. They believe there's Merovin. They believe there's these like children of the Christ out there. And there's these like these bloodline carriers. And they're looking to just jack into these people. Okay. <clears throat> these hosts, like these, these, they, they literally want certain types of people's bloodlines in order to be able to co- so that the the parasite has a host that effectively doesn't reject it. So they look for specific bloodlines to do that stuff. They are trying to raise up a seed line for this anti-messiah. Like that's fundamentally the the key component of it. So don't give your stinking DNA to anyone. Gosh, dang it. You don't have to do it for anything. No matter how much they're like, just do a quick genetic screening. None of that. No, no. Say, I do not consent. You can't have my biometric data. No. Pervert, stay out of my body. Don't you do it. But see, they're all obsessed with the, the seed. I'm saying, y'all, don't you let them do it. And then uh, anyways, so how to do research for it? Yeah, there's this old way of doing things, y'all, called research. And it's super exhausting because it requires you to dive into books. And it requires you to go find people that that's their job and their specialty. Okay, like there's heraldists, people that like that's all they do. All they do is investigate bloodlines. So if you really want to find your bloodline, you can go about the old ways of doing research. You can go online and start doing ant like family tree charts. You can start to build that you know, like yourself. My mom was like spent a lot of time and a lot of money doing that when I was younger. Like there's there's if you come from a, a family of certain prestige, you can pay a lot of money to the heraldists that do that job. That like that's their that they hold the records for that. But I don't know that I have a lot of like tips and tricks for like how to like determine that beyond that. Like you just, you guys got to look it up for yourself. Like you got to hunt, you know what I'm saying? Like it, it's not easy, like, but you got to work hard, like overcome resistance. It's good for you, you know, but like there's libraries that you can go in there and look up books of genealogy. You can find family records. Like I went to the public library back in Flagstaff, Arizona, because I was trying to <clears throat> find marriage certificates and death certificates and all kinds of stuff. So like I went back to the public records office and I started looking through there, like, you can do that kind of stuff. It requires diligence. It requires sometimes a little bit of money as well to buy records or access to records, hospital records, death certificates, that kind of stuff. But that's one of the ways to kind of build that out. They used to have these things called Bibles in people's houses. You ever heard of these things? There used to be like in the house, the family Bible that used to have your genealogy in, in a family tree. Like when people got married, when they died, children, all that stuff. That used to be in people's Bibles. It was a crazy, intense reality that people used to believe. And understand that that was a good thing to do, like pass that on to your children. And instead, we're like, oh, you can look it up on Facebook if we're related. So change the system, y'all. Like keep records. Good advice. That is, it is tough. Like I, I started doing that a little bit, you know, and uh, it's not easy if you don't know a ton about your ancestors. It, it is a little bit tough, but, you know, I think that that can tell us a lot more about where we came from anyways than these, you know, quote unquote DNA test that just might tell us, you know, what, uh, what countries our family may have come from and stuff like that doesn't really tell you a lot about your bloodline. If what you're trying to find out is what was my family involved with? Who were they? You know, it's good to maybe try to find how Nathan was saying resources that could lead you to who these people are versus just, you know, their, their quote unquote DNA. Um, so I appreciate you answering that. Um, speaking of Flagstaff, Arizona, I had somebody ask if you could elaborate a little bit on Flagstaff, um, underground tunnels, uh, Catholic churches, knowledge about Babbitt's involved, Knights of Columbus and SRA abuse. Um, 
I would be interested in signs that would indicate there are underlying memories. I think they're talking about themselves. Um, so if you could, if you want to talk about Flagstaff a little bit, um, I know there's a bunch of people that that live in Arizona or are around there. And that's always sort of a curious state since you have uh, so much experience with it. Um, yeah, on one side of it, <clears throat> like there's a there's a major Catholic church there. It's like a Francis de Assisi or something like that. It's right off the main, the main drag there in, uh, in that. And that's definitely a place where they were participants in it. Now that was back in the nineties. I can't say for anything contemporaneous with like modernity. I was back in there until I was like nine years old and then my family moved out of there, but that Catholic church had a whole bunch of this going on in it. They were doing rites and rituals inside that ceremony, inside that place on Saturday nights and, uh, involving the chalice and the cup and sacrificing infants inside that building. And then, the next morning there was a desecration stuff uh done in there but <clears throat> specifically in flagstaff like flagstaff was found like you gotta you gotta understand something about flagstaff that's different for those of you that are not from arizona you're thinking a desert but it's not <clears throat> flagstaff arizona sits on a really high plateau like it's a mountain range up there and there's like nine thousand foot mountains 10 12 000 foot mountains right there and they're all volcanic peaks okay anywhere where you have volcanoes you have like portals Okay, where places where beings go in and out from underworld uh, to the, the surface world. And so there's a lot of cave systems. There's a lot of what are called lava tubes. There's a lot of caverns that go through that area. And there's a lot of obsidian. There's a lot of <clears throat> volcanic glass. And these are all like key components that that intertwine with a place that's called a high place or cone of power. Um, when you go to the prom points of prominence, like the highest point in any land or any state is a place where people that that worship the, the sun, the moon, the stars, and the heavenly hosts, that's a very important place for them to go and engage in their rituals. Those mountains there, that's called like Mount Mount Humphreys. I always called it Mount Prescott. Like that has a lot of names. It's one of like the the, the cardinal sacred points to the, the First Nations people, to the natives. They all believe that this was a place where the gods would come down, uh, various forms of it. Like the Hopis would had these things called cochinas. That these were like these angels, these beings, divine beings that would come down and and, and uh, have sex with daughters and children during the between the winter solstice and the summer solstice was the or the there was this time frame where where they would come down and they would give them their daughters and they would uh, take these make these effigy dolls out of cottonwood roots and then they would have them nail them above their beds and that was their like familiar spirit like we were talking about earlier that's kind of like their guardian or their ones like that it's it's the same kind of stuff if you notice this is the same things. They would swear oaths up there, and they would do these rituals where these beings, these divine beings, were called upon to come out of the the, cav the caverns and the caves to come and engage in these rituals and to do the same types of things of trying to sire off generational bloodlines. That's where like my whole life had its start point was on that filthy place. So from there, like you have this place that's called um, Mount Prescott Observatory. Okay, or uh, shoot, I may have just gotten the name wrong. Uh, it's the place where basically Pluto was discovered. There, it's a, it's a very famous observatory. Okay, and this is where Pluto, the planet, was first discovered, the wandering star. Like it was the first place that it was discovered and the founder of it. And so there's a major uh, amount of observatories there. Like one of the most expensive scientific programs in the United States Navy is located just outside of Flagstaff. And it's their like interferometer. So it's something that uses lasers and mirrors to do observations and communications on this. Like it looks like a giant Y shape they're like three mile long tracks that all of these look like telescopes are able to interline and track with stars and be able to communicate and send data back and forth this is like a multi-billion dollar project it's one of the most advanced observatories in the world so when you have a high desert which is like the the air is very uh, devoid of moisture and you're at a high altitude it allows them to be able to communicate with these beings up there you guys because a lot of these are like the celestial hosts these are beings up there in the sky it's not just like some kind of like puffy fiery like farts like galaxies far, far away. Like they're beings up there. Okay. These are like wandering stars. It's like a real thing in the Bible. Like you read about it. He's like, the Bible's not lying. Like these, these things, like they've done some doofus stuff. They did not keep their first estate. Like they're rebels. And so they are shot callers up there. That's why they have the black cube cult of Satan, of Saturn. Like that's literally what these beings are communicating with and why there's hundreds of billions of dollars investigated, invested by the Jesuits and by a lot of these dark orders and these dark sciences to take these high places and build these communications platforms, these observatories. A lot of them are communications for two-way communications back and forth between these beings. Okay, so Flagstaff's at its at its fundamental basis is is what it is 
as a city because it's a communion point between the divine, between the heavens and the hell. Okay, so you have you have access points into the underworld and you have communication points with the celestial hosts. And so I I literally believe that's why like Meteor Crater, Arizona, which is just outside there, like I believe that's a that's a place where it opened up. I don't believe that's like a meteor strike that came down and I believe that's literally what happens when something comes up from underneath. And that was one of their portals of these, like a fallen watcher when they came out from their prison cell. That's what they left when they came out. So they there is like a, a ritual mixing between realms, all three realms, between the underworld, the earth, and the heavens there in Flagstaff, Arizona. So cults m migrate there like crazy, and it's it's a massive hotbed for occult activity. And then it's just outside of Sedona, Arizona, which is a major gatekeeping place for a lot of what is like the New Age ideology, like the Ishtar goddess worship and stuff like that, a lot of alien and abduction stuff. The reason that it's all centered in there, you guys, is because they've been opening these portals to this stuff from all these occultists that are engaging in this Crowleyan black magic and all this other stuff. They've been engaging in that stuff in that area, saturating that area, and they've opened up a lot of these rifts and portals through bloodshed. When you when you spill the blood, you open a gateway. You, you have blood that perpetually cries out as a witness. And so because of that, these other beings can come in, and they can masquerade as good angels or as bad angels or as light workers or as any other form of it. They can come in as, as you know, a kundalini. They can masquerade as whatever they want. They're shapeshifters fundamentally. That's what they are. And so they'll, they'll come to people and deceive them and lead them astray in any kind of manner or way. So my family, uh, like one of the worst things that happened to me out there is they had a, a warehouse that's just outside of Flagstaff, like up 180, where they did pit fights. Like they literally had a pit inside of just an all metal like warehouse building where they they put they drop you down in this pit, lower you down on this pit and make you fight with other children or other men and film it. And then they bet on it and make money off of it like a fight club, um, but for smuff porn and stuff like that. So Flagstaff is filthy. Arizona is a whole state. I mean, I guess every state is, you know, the whole country, like you said, is based off and built off of Luciferian foundations. So, you know, it is, it is interesting being able to connect dots. It's so validating for people to hear about these different spots that they may have had abuse in or experiences, and then to have that corroborated by somebody like you. Um, I'm going to shift gears just a little bit. We had some questions, had a couple questions about, uh, I guess the, the black awakening in a sense. And somebody had asked if you could talk on what you would do if the MK MK ultra slash SRA army is unleashed and how to best prepare. Man, I would smile. <laughs> I'll tell you that much to me. That's the greatest day. You know, I'll just say this. Like the reason I'm out here is for those people. Like, that's my real love. I love them more than I love everybody else. I do. Like I, I love the the people that have been through this hell. Like to me, that's that's the only family like I know. I understand. I have I like I have a wife and children and like family here kind of thing. But that's like the only familiar people to me is like other chosen ones. These people that that were raised up to be a part of this other army. Like they understand me. And like my experience is more than anybody else. And so on one side of it, like I want them to also know the way out of it when you wake up after it, because it's going to, it may not last long. You guys like the black awakening really is not something that's going to last like a long time at the, the, the black awakening. For those of you that aren't familiar with that phrase, that this is, uh, the, the book, the black awakening, uh, rise of the satanic super soldier and the coming chaos rust is Dar's book. You can find PDFs of this out there. They're supposed to, leave, shh, supposed to be released this winter again. So just hang in there. There's going to be more copies coming around. Pray constantly. But he, go, he, he goes into like a ton on this. But basically, here's the deal, y'all. Chosen ones are like super soldiers, okay? Like this like goes back to Ubermanch and a lot of this started out with the Nazis and the SS. And like my my mom's dad comes over from Poland and stuff like that. And they all had this like intermingling with these, these secret scientists, these people that were obsessed with finding the ways of controlling the mind and controlling the will. And so they started manipulating people and shattering their minds and doing all of this stuff with Mangala and a lot of these people that were programmers who were, who were trying to utilize trauma-based mind control to, to make spies, okay? And the Black Awakening really has been this rise of this, this new army that they're trying to raise up in secret, okay? Saboteurs, fundamentally. These are people that are going to – they have kill lists. This should be the greatest threat in the United States military. For any of you that are watching this as part of the military, y'all, this is your real adversary. You think there's some terrorist over there that's going to walk over the border from here. That's a problem. You, the, the biggest usurping sabotage takeover, absolute <laughs> – 
well orchestrated plan to 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 take from you the keys to your Trident nuclear submarine is a foot. You know what I mean? Like these are program multiples who their job it is is to take over an area through chaos, confusion, targeted killings, targeted assassinations, through the dismantling of the social structure so that those that are a part of the next wave, which would be like the Luciferian army, the Luciferian rulers are able to take the seats of power after that, that, that chaos unfolds. So their programming is a lot of it is, is linked to kill lists. Okay. It's to assassinations and others it's to targeted chaos. So they're going to go in and take links of chain that they get from the hardware store. And they're going to go start throwing them on transformers. They're going to start blowing up sub switch substations. They're going to start taking out the power supply lines. They're going to start taking their poisons, their prepackaged poisons and start injecting that into the water supply. They're going to start burning down fire stations, destroying police stations. They're the ones who like, when you see these riots that, that suddenly like break out seemingly out of nowhere, there's an army of people behind the scenes who orchestrated that there's an army of people who financed that okay that's what the black awakening is it's satan it's literally his embodiment of his soldiers his special forces his delta operators who are out there as sleeper cells who don't know that they're don't know that that's what they're made for <clears throat> who are literally going to get triggered and signaled and sent out in mass to cause chaos okay they're going to take over and usurp inside the military, start killing each other. Start, and this is like literally soldiers are going to wake up and have in, I mean, fratricide. People are going to start killing other soldiers. They're not going to know what's going on and they're going to start losing terribly. Okay. I say that I'm going to smile on that day because I feel like on one side of it, you have to understand like there is an inevitability to some of this stuff. Like it's inevitable. This is going to happen. Like there really is many, many millions of these other chosen ones who are out there right now who are still online, who are still waiting for phone calls, who are still waiting for activation, and who are going to go and commit massive carnage. It's going to happen. Like, it's not some kind of like, oh, I wonder. It's an inevitability. And because of that, you need to take every action that you possibly can right now to prepare yourself. And I say that because I think fundamentally, those of you that are chosen ones yourselves, those of you that have gone out and purchased those tools and build your kits and build your explosives and do all the rest of that stuff. You shoot and you shovel and you shut up and you do all that kind of stuff at night. You guys have a, a deep need to be able to get yourself out of this before that fact, because when you wake up and your body in your trunks full of bodies and everything else is going down, it's a freaking nightmare. It's a nightmare to wake up from this stuff. It's an absolute hell. And you have to deal with this stuff when you have families and children and dogs and like you have a real normal life that's well established. You have a real strong, deep cover that suddenly just melts off your face and you're not going to understand what the heck just happened to you because the front side of you has no conscious memory of any of this other stuff. But you know what? There's little clues along the way that can help to elucidate. You have something else going on inside you. You have some back programming that you've got to get dealt with. And like, that's why I'm out here. Like I would have never come out with any of this stuff. Seriously, I would have just... I would have gone and built my redoubt. I would have disappeared with my wife. That's what I wanted to do, y'all. I didn't want anything to do with coming out publicly. I wanted to take my wife and go disappear and prepare myself for the coming chaos. Like, that's it. I wanted to save her and to save me and to preserve ourselves until after that fact, like after the smoke clears, because you are going to have a lot of people that are going to be stuck with all these questions. Like my book subtitle, like trying to a man, one man's journey to uncover the 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 family secrets buried in his bloodstained past. Some of you are going to have these bloodstained past that you're going to wake up to and you need answers for right away. And you know what? That's why I'm out here screaming from the rooftops for years. Some of these same things over and over again is so that you guys can find the way out now. Get out now while you can. And even if it's not after, even if it's after the fact and you're watching this after the fact, listen, no matter what you've done or what's been done to you, you can still find healing and restoration. Like you can truly find peace amidst all of that stuff because I know the night terrors that come with it. I know the dread that comes from it. I know the drugs and the alcohol and the addictions and everything that you do to try to drown it out. Like I have been down this road for so many years of my life and I'm trying to extend to you an opportunity to find freedom ahead of the fact or after the fact, no matter where you're at on that equation. If there is freedom and confession, there's freedom and restoration that's available to all of us and you don't have to be a participant in that. And you know what? That's why I'm out here publicly. That's out there why I'm out here trying to, to say this stuff because I know what it feels like to wake up after that. So on one side of it, that's how I'm preparing myself for it, okay? That's like fundamentally another component of it. Physically, you know, I try to prepare myself for it by, <laughs> I mean, I used to have, uh, well, 
I used to prepare myself for coming chaos for sure. You know what I mean? I had a bug out bag, fundamentals. I had bug out bag. I had escape routes. I had physical maps, not just talking about like GPS stuff, I'm talking about physical maps. I had escape plans, different alternative routes. Very important. Practice them. Wore my backpack. Took my wife out. We practiced this stuff. It's like a video I just posted about bug out plans. Actually practicing this stuff out, you guys, in case this this stuff this stuff takes place because it's good to know where to go and what to do. But there's fundamental basics to survival that are important and imperative to that. Tools. I think at the end of the day, the things that I like most prepare to prep myself with are skills. At the end of the day, I still have the opportunity to learn skills. You have an opportunity to learn skills, learn trades, learn opportunities to make yourself useful and capable amidst that stuff. Disciplining yourself, detoxifying yourself, all this stuff while you can and while you're capable is what makes you more able to manage and, and weather a very stressful and chaotic environment. So those are fundamental to that. Yeah, you can go down the body armor route and get yourself pistols and rifles and train with them though. Don't bother going and getting any of this stuff without training. I'm telling you, just use it. Otherwise you're going to revert to your training. So be diligent. Great answer. I had a, another question that sort of piggybacks on that regarding the mass shootings that we see now. I think we see the, you know, the, uh, the effects of these triggers and what they can do to people, um, in a very small aspect right now, we've seen it for, you know, many decades with some of the shootings, the school shootings, even, you know, different terrorist quote unquote, uh, attacks that happen. Um, and, you know, way later on, we find out that these things were actually planned, you know, and, and you have to wonder what type of a person would go commit something like that. You know, how do you get somebody to go if it is planned, shoot up a school? You know, how do you get a child to shoot up a school? One thing I always thought was interesting after learning about this was how people don't ever question these children that go into these schools and how they just happen in, in a a very chaotic environment where there's adults screaming, children running around, how these kids somehow get a weapon, go to school, and they're so accurate. They're actually killing a lot of people. Yeah. Nobody seems to wonder, how did this child learn to use this weapon when the families are like, I don't know how they got this gun, and I don't know what's going on, you know? And the news story is that it's so random. A kid randomly got a gun, took it to a school. Nobody seems to want to ask, you know, how did they become so skilled in this, and like what would cause somebody so young to do this. So I wanted to, to get your feedback on mass shooters. Somebody said, um, are all these lone sh mass shooters that we're told are mentally ill actually MKU super soldiers? Do the shooters even know what they are doing? If a shooter lives in prison, do they ever remember being programmed? And are we getting closer to the truth of this ever being exposed? One of the, the best things you guys can do to investigate this for yourself. <clears throat> Anytime one of these pops off, don't jump into the emotional hype stories of it right away. Give it some time to like let the juices of the emotional chaos of it <clears throat> unfold themselves. But if you watch the pictures and the progression, if they don't go through the whole Omega programming where they kill themselves afterwards, because that's a major component of these, you'll find that's why they're dead. Like they kill themselves is what they say all the time, right? It's it's not like that, okay? The 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 basis of programming that gets put into the system right away early on, especially if somebody's going to be involved in in killing and assassination or anything like that is what's called Omega programming, where the person commits self self deleting themselves, they kill themselves, okay, you have to deal with like, that's why they kill themselves, fundamentally, because they don't want any witnesses, they don't want to have to deal with the fact that sooner or later this person could talk about it. But a great example of that is James Holmes, who was the Batman killer. If you guys remember the Joker and all this other stuff back in Aurora, Colorado, this is just, okay. On one side of it, a lot of these are, there's a lot more than what meets the eyes. They portrayed him at his court hearings with this crazy hair, like he was this delusional psycho, right? The, the lone wolf crazy guy. That's always what they brand. And I'm just telling you as strongly as possible, anytime they brand somebody as crazy, Understand that there's a person there, like a real person, okay? James Holmes was a neuroscientist. Do you understand what I'm saying right now? That's not crazy person. This person was like a brain surgeon level mindset, okay? He was brilliant, one of the highest accolades and taken under the wing of some of the smartest people, period. He's like a, a, a graduate student, meaning like he's working on his master's and doctorate and stuff like that. Well, his psychiatrist, his psychologist at the time is a former CIA psychiatry, like one of the heads of the CIA psychiatry, like heads of the, the mind control government kingpin of the entire country, takes this guy under his wings and then brainwashes him with drugs 
and with neuro-linguistic programming to go and do this mass killing. When the police officers, like the arresting police officers found him, he was he was sitting there trying to pull the trigger over and over and over and over again to kill himself, but he couldn't. OK, that's the reason he's alive. And if you watch them over the course of their trials and their hearings, you will see their handlers, which is what the people are. A lot of times the defendant or the, the mental health practitioner are in there to make them get caught up on drugs, sleep like they will. They will re-traumatize them and program them to keep them in this this mind loop. And I'm telling you, so many of these mind control, these shooters, these mass shooters, especially the big ones, like the big public agenda ones that are used to fuel like a Hegelian dialectic of like problem, create the problem, manage the reaction and like offer the solution like take the guns away, take the, take the high capacity magazines away, those scary assault rifles, whatever it is. Generally it's that stuff. Take away people's rights. Fundamentally, those are engineered with assets. Okay. They're, they have an intelligence team. They have an asset. They deploy them. They use them a sleeper cell predominantly, and then they burn them. That's like how it works. Textbook style. So like we just had another one out in Colorado that was in Glenwood caverns, <clears throat> which is like a, like an amusement park area, but he killed himself before he went to the mass shooting. And he had all of the very same things that they're trying to be like, look at these big, bad, scary people that are prepping for the end of the world. You know, he had body armor and he had rifles and guns and handguns and helmet. And oh, he, he was really ready to do a lot of damage here. And But then he wrote on the, like he has writing on the wall and then he kills himself. You know what I'm saying? When I see stuff like that, I think the guy was murdered. I do not think he killed himself. I think the man was murdered and I think he's planted there. It's a totally different scenario. So, this is what's like why I'm like you got to deal with sleeper cells. Yeah, we have a lot of sleeper cells here in the country. These are like one person. When I see body counts in a lot of these mass shootings, I understand that they're not as trained as you would think they are. Some of them you see like they really are a child who has it's gone psychotic because of all the the drugs that they're on these mind altering drugs, and they literally have a, a a spirit of murder and lust and hatred. And like when you take these drugs, you guys, you literally open portals in your mind because it's sorcery, and they literally have demons start to infiltrate people's minds. Like people get on Ambien, they go crazy, they hear voices like schizophrenia. These are real psychoactive drugs that open doors to demons. And a lot of these drugs are made out of blood. 80% of all the blood that is donated to like those blood donation centers, 80% of it is used by pharmaceutical companies to make drugs. Like people are eating blood. They're eating drugs that make them go crazy and open up these demonic doorways to let these spirits rule over these people. This is why so many people commit suicide when they go on antidepressants. Like you're opening the doors to these other things. So anytime one of these shootings happens, like you can, you can, track carefully the counsel behind them the doctors behind them watch and look and investigate for yourself because almost always there's a whole other story that you're not getting the full equation on okay so and then piggybacking off of that i had another question um that sort of minimizes this again of somebody asking about for those of us who've grown up in church and were unfortunately oblivious to the evil people in leadership or just in the congregation are there specific things, clues to know or look for if the person sitting next to you who's super friendly and seems to be a genuine believer is really living a double life? Yeah, that's a good one. Lots of wolves in the church, y'all. <laughs> you betcha. Question, where did Satan go when the church was booming? You know what I'm saying? Like right in the beginning, Ananias and Sapphira, Satan enters into them and he's all like, come on into the church. Guess what? They brought a big tithe check with them. You betcha. They bribed their way right in. They're like, Peter, we sold our property. Here's a bunch of money. He's all like, mm, you're going to die, son. They did. Like, by the way, that's how he extended forgiveness to them. I just want to say this because all these people just constantly like, you need to forgive everybody. You just forgive them. Just forgive them. All these perverts, all these psychos, just forgive them. I'm like, tell me, how did Peter forgive Ananias and Sapphira? They died on the spot. Just saying, shut your mouths. You have no idea the level of insanity of evil that people are out there. I'm just telling you. And some of these people are literally carrying the seed of the demons inside them. Like they are super nasty, rotten to the core. And they are sent in by design to cause chaos in the churches. That is the place they go. Like there's terrain maps of churches that satanic covens have. And they go to those churches. They send in spies to the churches. And they're like, let's see if this church has any real like chutzpah. You know what I mean? Any like balls to it. Like are they a real threat or are they not? Because like they are good at intel. You know what I'm saying? Like they have a really good intelligence array where they're trying to understand that they are fighting a war. Like they actually view you as the enemy. Like you think these people are like, they're just like, you know, kind of bad people stuff. No, they're like brilliant. 
They are absolutely dedicated to causing massive amounts of chaos and bloodshed and violence, but very quietly, very covertly, because once again, their whole camouflage is people's ignorance. So when they go into the church, they put on their churchianity suits. You know what I mean? They know the language. They know the lingo. They know all of the phrases. They know when to lift their hands. They know when to do the holy roller shakes, whatever version of your denomination that you're a part of. Like they're trained in it. Okay. Like I was living on a property in uh, North Carolina and there was this homeless guy that the people that we were staying with, they like let him stay there because he was living on the streets and. Anyways, he was a witch, okay? So you find that out, technically a wizard. He was a male with a familiar spirit, okay? But they didn't know that at the time. But, like, we started having a lot of conversations because he was obviously not a believer, but the people that we were staying with were believers, and they just loved people, and they, like, met their needs. Like, they're like, you don't have a home? Well, we got a school bus if you want to live in that. Like, it's converted to be a home kind of. You want to stay there? And Anyways, he was he was somebody that would, like, do <clears> – <throat> He ended up getting to know me over the time, and I shared a lot of my testimony with him, and he was like started sharing with me how he got into witchcraft, and he started going to a church in North Carolina outside of Asheville, and nobody there really took notice of him. Like he was a younger man. He didn't have a father figure in his life. His his life was sucked, and but when he went there, nobody befriended him. None of the pastors, the associate pastors, deacons, nobody like took notice of him, but this older lady did, and she was so sweet to him and just loved on him and cared about him and was super compassionate and just was like took him out to lunch and like just took care of him. Like met his needs, helped him out, spent time with him, loved on him. And after a couple of – over a period – this is grooming, by the way. She's grooming him. Over a period of time, they developed this relationship and this friendship. Well, then she said, do you, wanna, do you want me to show you how I have power and I'm more powerful than every other person in this church? He was like, what are you talking about? She's like, I'm the one who runs this church. And then she shared with him how she has infiltrated this church, and she was part of this this coven that operated there in Asheville, and they targeted this church, and they sent her in there, and that she does witchcraft and sorcery against this church, and she takes selected items out of the people's purses, donations, plates. She had keys to the building. She would go in there and do rituals and be able to destroy this church and keep its power subdued. She would she was like, she would have him sit there, and she'd be like, listen, I'm going to have the pastor say these words. She would write them down. She's like, I'm gonna have, I'm gonna put these words in his mind while he's doing a sermon, and he's gonna say these words. And he would sit there and he would watch the pastor say these words come out of his mouth. And she's like, Well, I have this doorway in because of all of this infidelity or these other areas of things that had happened in the church that she found out about that she used as like a legal door to start to control and to influence them. This is like this satanic infiltration of the church, you guys. It's been going on from the very beginning, and it still takes place to this day. So, like my 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 friend, as he was telling me this, saw this power and he asked, like, teach me train me. And so he got brought in to this coven. He wasn't born into this stuff, but he got brought in and started getting trained on sorcery and witchcraft and started learning how to do ritual magic to be able to control people. He fundamentally wanted to be able to get a job and wanted to have a girlfriend. And so he wanted to learn love potions and this other stuff. And so he got sucked into this world. And then he started doing spell crafting for other people. People found out that if you want to go to an interview, you can hire him and he would charge him money, the wages of divination. And he would give them a spell that they would do, you know, to get the job and it would work. And so then they'd pay him more. You know, and so like he developed this trade craft while he was out there. So like he and I are sitting there on two ends of the spectrum of understanding like this is how the enemy operates and this is how the enemy infiltrates. Okay. For those of you that are trying to identify this stuff, you need to understand that on the, the core basis of it, they want to work in children's ministry. They want to work in children's ministry and they want to work on a lot of times in custodial janitorial work because basically the churches are all because of their design structure, because they have buildings that are that are available. Yeah. They always want volunteers. They need tons of volunteers. So if somebody shows up and they're like, I'm going to help, I'm going to help. I'm going to be the most helpful, the most, the most awesome. I'll be the greatest of all of you guys. I'll be the servant of you all. I know that's like, doesn't seem like should be the red flag, but it should be the red flag. I'm just saying, put that giant screaming red billboard flag up and be very, very cautious to give that person access. Okay. Give them opportunities, but you're supposed to watch somebody's fruit. And fruit can take months or years to really manifest. It says, behold, I send you out. Be warned. Be cautious. I send you out a sheep among wolves. Be, be, but you shall know them by their fruit. You know what I mean? Like these, there are people who are putting on sheep's clothing and masquerading in front of your face. They know how to play the game, but you will know them by their fruits, he said. So you need to learn how to examine people's fruits very carefully to scrutinize their fruits. Look at their children. If they have children, you need to look at the fruits of their children, their relationships. You need to be able to identify like where is they're trying to get to. Also, if you have people that are intercessors, people that know how to pray and ask the Father to forgive the sins that are empowering any spirits upon any of the people that are coming into the building, asking for the forgiveness of sins, of any rituals that are being done in that place, like you need to learn how to engage in spiritual warfare to build a hedge of protection in that place. You know, like fundamentally, I just, I'll say this, I don't go to church. Like I don't go to these places because everyone I've ever gone to, I find infested. Everyone I find is just totally infested. It's infested. And then when you want to like deal with it, 
Like you want to like root it out. You know, that's all I ever want to do. I want to burn that stinking thing down. When you find it, like you need to drive it out from amongst yourselves. Like you need to have zero tolerance for this kind of stuff taking place, but you need to do that by asking for everything hidden to be revealed for asking for the forgiveness of sins of all of those cursed objects that are in that building that all of the secret things that are stashed under you'll find like little body bags with bones and stuff like that in the church you'll find all kinds of cursed objects or amulets they like to give gifts to the pastors and stuff like russ was super careful not to receive gifts from everyone he's all like i know you want to give me that you're so sweet i don't want it you know because they understood there was an ulterior motive a lot of times of why this stuff was there so you'll see marriages and divorces take place car accidents all this stuff that's because they get these witches in there to destroy everything so I don't think that that's the model you're supposed to operate. I think that's a business model. Fundamentally, it's much more effective in the business scheme of the world. But I think that you should break bread with one another in each other's houses. Like that's how you get to know if somebody's a wolf or not. Like it's really hard to do that in a big environment where everyone's like, oh my gosh, like if we don't make enough money here to pay the bills, like if we don't have enough volunteers here to take care of this, like you're under a totally different pressure system. And so I think because of that, people are willing to open their doors to people that are absolutely the wolves and they'll keep them there because they become dependent on them because they a lot of times offer, offer the biggest amount of time their contribution, whether that's time or money, in order to keep the place going. So it sucks, but I find them on the worship team a lot. You find them infiltrated into the the pastoral ring, the deacons. They'll be the best friends of the wives. Like it's brutal. Absolutely. Yes. And you're right. And, and it's not just churches, you know, this Luciferian system has really infiltrated every avenue of society and every industry, you know. So it's something we all have to be discerning about and I love how you said break bread in your house you know people have to remember that they can take their power back and that they have a direct line to God at any time you don't have to go through a priest you don't have to go through a church you can do what you need right from home you know or, or create your own church you know invite people that you actually trust and know that aren't you know wolves and sheep's clothing into your church or join somebody else's church you know so that's really reassuring to know that and I appreciate you answering that one um, this next question is a little bit supernatural, and I'm I'm curious to hear your answer on it too. Somebody wanted to pick your brain about supernatural Bible changes, and they said, meaning the Bible has been and is being changed supernaturally, and if he is aware of this, and not a translation thing either. I'm talking all Bibles, all translations have been and are being supernaturally changed, and this is an end time sign and also fulfillment of biblical prophecy. One of the most recognizable changes is Isaiah 11, 6, which is you, which used to say the lion shall lie down with the lamb, but now says wolf also shall dwell with the sheep. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, this is totally getting into the, uh, <clears throat> oh, what is it called? Oh man, the word's just totally escaping my mind right now. Anyways, I do not believe that all of our Bibles have been supernaturally changed. First of all, I'll just say that right now. <clears throat> I believe the texts are preserved and I understand Mandela effect. <laughs> yeah, which is a fun rabbit hole to go down. I mean, there's some there's some there's some absolute peculiarities in there, a hundred percent stuff that I'm like, yeah, I definitely have, I for those of you've never heard of this, there are some strange things of like words that you remember, catchphrases like Luke, I am your father, or Luke, I am your father. All these other things. No, I am your father. All these like Seeming things that we remember, pop culture, advertisements, things that uh, we are like for certain, like this used to be that way. Fruit Loops used to be spelled one way, but then we look at it in the modern ways and it's spelled different. And you're like, what? there's some like strange stuff. Okay. You can launch yourself down that rabbit hole anytime you want. It's quite fun. And uh, I think there's absolute validity to some of that. However, in relation to the spiritual, supernatural changes to the Bible, no, I don't agree with that. I don't. I, I've, I've, looked, I've looked at this stuff super diligently. I was way down the conspiracy, psycho, crazy rabbit hole, every corner of it for many, many years, you guys. It was really fun. It was a wild ride. I highly recommend it. It's a great time. But there's there's avenues of it that are, that are stuff you can test out. And you know what? I have not found validity to that. I have not seen evidence that has been absolutely substantiated that that the scripture has been changed supernaturally because none of those things affect any doctrine and if you actually had an enemy who was time traveling and was able to change the bible he's not going to change a simple verse like that i'll just say that it's not a big deal verse you know what i'm saying he would change doctrinally big important stuff like who rose and conquered death and took captivity captive and like there's some major core tenets of doctrinal disputes that he would have changed if he had an opportunity to do so but it says yahuwah watches over his word day and night like that means he ain't nobody else going to get in there. You know what I'm saying? That's not to say translators haven't totally mingled and fingered around in there and screwed everything up like ridiculously psychopaths. The lying pen of the scribes is a real thing. However, the preserved texts, Hebrew, 
Greek, like they're preserved. Okay. They're like real literal texts that we can go and read and examine for ourselves. But if you don't know Hebrew, ancient Hebrew, that's what this chart is behind me. Well, I'm passionate about studying Hebrew, Eric, Erictology and uh, Sefer the Stars.net, Erictology.net. Just saying, learn ancient Paleo Hebrew. Look up Eric Bissell Paleo Hebrew. Best 57 part video series I've ever watched in my entire life because you know what? You can learn the languages and you're not dependent on everybody else. So, I, I have a lot more assurance in that. I read like 10 different translations on any given, like when I want to find out something, I'm like, okay, like this is an ISR scriptures translation, like my default one. I'm like, I love this one. But then I'll go to, an, I'll, I'll check out what a King James, King James Amplified. I'll go through all these ones, CJV. I'll go through all kinds of translations because it's beneficial. I understand that the English language is not preserved perfectly word for word, the scripture. It hasn't. Like it's a translation. You're never going to get it. Like there's a lot of words in there that are not translatable, period. So if you want to really know the word for yourself, you got to learn the languages for yourself, which is fun. It's a whole other treasure quest. Great answer. Interesting question too. We had a lot of really interesting questions for this one. Um, the next one is, could he discuss the 144,000 mentioned in Revelation? You know, yeah, they're like the counter strike force. You know what I'm saying? They're like kind of the immortals that are gonna go uh wage massive warp, man. They're uh it says they're twelve they're they're twelve tribes. You get twelve thousand in each tribe, you know. I've heard a lot of speculation. I here's what I here's what I'll say. I don't do a whole lot of commentary on eschatology because I otherwise I'm just gonna basically repeat other people's stuff. I've studied some out for myself enough, but I'm also I, I understand I'm looking through a glass somewhat dimly. And, uh, and my view shifts around on that a lot based off of like what I read and what I research at any given time. And so I don't want to make some big, like long declarative statement when I'm like, I don't really have that one pinned out or like flushed out super well. So I don't want to give like an answer on something that I'm still like, I'm moderately speculative about that. You could take a couple of different routes of what that look like on one side of it. I just hope they're basically like a massive special operations teams that just gets to go in and kill and slaughter and just devastate and wreak havoc on all kinds of the, the adversaries of truth and peace and life and that's my like hope and glory in that that like they like can't be killed. How freaking awesome. Man, what a what a sweet skill set. I'm just saying that would be the best. I think they could be like the hunters club that just gets to go root everyone out in their deep underground military bases and just swim right down into the magma and strangle the dragons and just have a great time while they're doing it. That's that's like my bet on it. I sure hope so. So we'll we'll find out. I sure hope I'm around to see. I really want to see that stuff. I don't want a pre-trib rapture. I'm going to say this right now and just poke people in the eye. Ever since I heard about the pre-trib rapture, I thought it was a super cowardice ideology and it just bummed me out. I'm like, what the heck do you guys want to get out of here for that? I want to be here for all of it. Like I want to be here for all the crazy, all the, all the absolute insane judgment side of it. I want to be here for all of it. I want to witness everything burned to ground to ash. Like I want to see all of it. I do. I do. I I've never understood why you wouldn't want to be the last man standing. I don't know why anybody else doesn't want to be the last person standing here proclaiming the gospel to every creature. Like, I don't know what the heck else you're supposed to do in your life. There's no retirement plan. I don't want to get sucked out of here in some kind of spaceship and miss the most important time when de deception is the most rampant in all the earth. And like a truthful man is the most valuable thing on the earth. Like I want to be a servant here to the end. I don't want to get out of here early at all. Like I want to be here till the very bitter end. That's literally my last, my dream of dream of dreams is to be the last man standing, proclaiming the gospel to the last creature that could ever hear it and repent and turn. You know, like that's what we should be in, in this for. Anyways, I could go on on that for a while, but <laughs> I don't want to get out of here. I want to fight to the end. <laughs> I have two more questions for you. Um, this one I thought was pretty good. This is a little shift of subject to you, but um, I've gotten asked this. I'm going to be curious to see your answer too. Somebody said, I would be interested in signs that would indicate there are underlying memories. So I'm guessing for somebody who might suspect that they're a survivor. And they said, what are some things that would indicate memory block or red flags? Well, missing time is a huge one that uh, like literally not understanding maybe where some of your last 20 minutes went, last uh, couple hours went, or previous weeks, days, months, years, like childhood, foundational years, lots of years of your life. All these missing time things is a huge, giant red flag. It's not normal. I know most people are brainwashed to think that or are like handled in their life to think that it's normal, but it's not normal to have massive, massive gaps of memory. Like it's not, I didn't know that until I was married to a woman who had like normal memory. It took us like not watching TV and talking to each other. And I was like, what? Like there's just these gigantic blocks of absences of voids of time. She was like trying to talk to me about hers. And I'm like, man, and I started sharing with her some of the memories that I did have. And she was horrified. And I was like, 
So maybe, maybe some of what I went through is not normal. Like there's, there's a lot of just like, if you've been around psychos, psychopaths for a long time, you don't know it's psychopathic. Like, you know, you think it's normal. You think it's normal. And so there's a lot of crazy, insane things that you may have experienced that you're, you physically and mentally don't understand is perverse and broken until you talk to somebody who hasn't had that experience. So that's fundamentally one of those like hallmark things that pops up. The other thing that, that is a, a key indicator is having stuff that you don't remember buying like objects, clothing, outfit changes, hairstyle changes, like stuff that you're like, why would I ever do that? You know, like I used to change outfits constantly. That was not normal. <laughs> like, I feel like I'm just absolutely insufferably miserable in the type of clothing that I was in and I need to change instantly. You know, like those were major things I've talked about as well, like handwriting changes, very fundamental differences between cursive and block capital letters. Those were like two major core personality sides of myself. That was something that was very distinct. One was very nice, like legible. The other looked like I was riding upside down on a chair underwater and you're like, and I was drunk. You know, it was like, what the heck is this cryptic creature that's coming out? That's one of those clues that you can have. Like there's, there's lots of little like um, conundrums along the way that'll help have that random phobias and fears to things that are not normal, like shower heads or lotions or snakes, spiders, like way out of the, the box stuff, almost like PTSD symptoms, you know, a terror of the night dread in your dreams dreams recurrent dreams of the same thing happening over and over horrible kind of dreams nightmares night terrors like a lot of times our dreams are bleed over states for our subconscious like these broken compartmentalized fractured pieces of ourselves are allowed to kind of speak through imagery that's one of those things that's in there for a reason so those are some of those hallmark indicators that are there demonic oppression poltergeist activity those are also major indicators as well that you need to pay attention to thank you for that um and then the last one is somebody asked, I would like for him to talk about instances where God increased his faith. Heck yeah. We'll end it on high note. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go somewhere good. You know, where has he increased my faith? Yeah. I got a lot of those, you know, I've had a lot of those. Seeing Naomi be born, like being in the tub with my wife. I was like one of those moments I didn't have a knife on me. Like I didn't have a gun on me. I was a walking arsenal for a long time. <laughs> when you get the power back, you're like, son, I'm going to carry all the guns forever. Like I had, but I had a super trained, scary, terrifying dude outside the door, but it was cool because I didn't have to be on. And I got to see him deliver me. My grandpa still flew in to try to receive my daughter, Naomi, like pervert. To see him bring a life out of my wife's barren womb grew my faith tremendously. It was a miracle. Like, that child's a miracle. She really is. She is a giant black eye to their filthy, perverse touch on me as a boy. Like, they crushed my epididymis early on to try to keep me from having children. And I suffered horrific pain for so long. And, like, I had a surgery later in life that I really believe helped that process. But I still believe she is a miracle. Every child that my wife has given birth to is a miracle for me. Like it's grown my faith. It's, it gave me a why that was big enough to do this war because up until then I really was like, remember like digging caches in the mountain, making copies of people's keys. Like I have a lot of keys to a lot of people's vacation houses in Colorado in the mountains. Like I have a lot of like buried treasures there, buried boom, boom things there. Like I had a big arsenal. I had a team of people like I had like a, a, I had a tiny army there, like built out, worked on for a long time. That's what I was going to go do. I was not going to come out here, do anything else. And then like my wife got pregnant and I'm like, I got to be a father now. And I didn't want to be a father. I didn't. Part of me did, but I did not want to be a father. I didn't want to have to raise children. I didn't want to have to face any of this. I didn't want to deal with this stuff. You know, I wanted out. I wanted to wait. I wanted to just get away. And I wanted to be left alone. And I knew if we had children, we had to fight for them. We had to do the one thing that my family did not do, which was wage a war 
against everybody. Everything. The very fabric of our society. Like the man in the mirror. We'd have to fight till the very bitter end. And uh, we'd have to lose everything. I've lost a lot to fight for my family. I've given up a lot for them. And I gave up my dream of freedom in a lot of ways to do this. Like becoming a father, becoming a um, a dad means you got to give up your yourself. You got to give up your dreams, your wants, your desires. I want to be lonely out there. I like the lonely out there with the with the wolves and with the critters under the the ground. I miss that. I miss the underground. You know. I miss the. I miss the operators, and I mer I miss those people. You know. I miss my brother in arms. And I can't go do that stuff because I do need to take care of my family. They need me. You know, they need me. And it grew my faith tremendously because I had to find out whether or not he would fight for me, whether or not he'd fight for my family, like whether or not he was who he says he is in the scriptures. Like, does he still care about people like he did for Abraham? Does he still care about people like he did David? You know, I needed to know for myself. And so I put my trust in him. And like I sat down, I set down my gun and I set down my knife and I sat there and I believed that he would watch my back, you know, and he slowly and incrementally helped me to, to do that. Like he slowly helped me to, to cast a lot of those weapons out there. It's not that I'm averse to firearms or that telling you guys, you got to get rid of yours. Like I had to throw them into the sea, you know, I had karambits and I had these pikals and I had very custom built tools for killing my style. And I had to literally throw them into the ocean as like an offering to him. I incrementally over years on this journey, I've had to, I've had to set that stuff down, my trip wires and my snares and my garrots and all of these things. I had to, I had to give it over to him, you know, like David gave the sword of the Goliath. He gave it to, to his, he gave it to the Holy of Holies, you know, he literally wrapped it up and gave it to him as an offering, you know? And when he went on the run later on, he went back and he got it. It was the only weapon he got. He, he used that great weapon to fight from the wilderness. And you know what? That's like what I've done. I've turned over to him, my sword, but seeing those children are living miracles. I still struggle. I struggle more to be a dad than anything else I do. Most everything else is moderately easy for me. Being a father is the hardest thing I've ever done. It's the hardest thing I've ever done because it's there every day. Like my abuse wasn't always there every day, but being a dad is, and it's brutal. It's brutal because you've got to give up your dreams. You've got to give up your hopes. You're, you're trying to give, I'm looking at my son, Abraham. He's crawling around. We've never had a boy before. And I'm watching him crawl around and get into everything. He's so curious. Like I'm seeing him be free. I'm seeing my son be free and it's beautiful, but it's been hell to get here. It's been hell to get here. It has. There's a lot of beautiful things that my father has done along the way to encourage and grow my faith. But you know what? He grew my faith by letting me go into the fire. He grew my faith by letting me suffer tremendously. Like we have suffered bodily. We've suffered poverty. We've suffered scarcity. We have suffered lack. We've suffered bitterness and bondage and persecution. We've suffered tremendously, but in our suffering, he's teaching us obedience. That's what I've seen in it. The greatest thing that he did to grow my faith was throw me into the fire. He, he gave me poison early on in my life to inoculate me to the inevitable onslaught that was coming for deceit that was going to break out across all the earth. Like he inoculated me to it. He gave me enough poison to almost kill me. He allowed them to poison me enough. But you know what? He preserved my life. And he's raised up these children. Like I'm literally watching my children grow up in front of my face. And it's the strangest thing I've ever seen because I never thought I'd see it. I never really planned for this contingency. And here I am seeing how he provides for us, seeing that in, in the little, it's better to have herbs in a, in a house of peace than the fattened calf in a house of strife. And I had a lot of fattened calf meals in a house of strife growing up. And I understood that it wasn't worth it. It wasn't worth it. It's not worth it. 
I still long for the the ability to fight back against this. I still long for the ability to wage war against these criminals and these covert creeps. But you know what? The way that I'm doing that is by giving up my fam- giving my family the opportunity to live, to give them the opportunity to run their race. I don't know what Abraham's going to do. I don't know what just Naomi's going to do in Jubilee or Pearl, but you know what? I know that I get to see them do it. Whatever it is they're going to do, I'm going to be around as long as I can to watch them become who it is that Yahuwah made them to be. And so they, they've grown my faith, and uh, and they have, they've shown me life, and I needed life, and uh, I've got a lot of life now. I've got a lot of death still in there, but you know what? I'm getting to see a lot of life every day, and it's what I needed most. That's beautiful. I know my faith increases every time I hear somebody like you speak. And I thank you, Nathan, for bearing your soul and your heart. You know, struggles aren't easy. And it's really reassuring for a lot of people to know that that you're human, you know, and, and you've come so far and that struggling is a natural part of this progression and that it's okay, you know, and that God is still with us in those moments in our deepest despair and in our biggest struggles that we can still turn to him And that we can lean on him and surrender all to him and trust that he has our best plans in mind. And that even though his plan might, might not be what our plan is, it's still the perfect divine plan, you know, and your life is such a testament to that. And I thank God that you have those beautiful babies because they've been such a motivation for you to come out and speak to all of us, you know, and and it's going to be a legacy that they're going to get to learn one day, you know, and hopefully, like you said, you give them that torch. And now you've broken that trauma from your family, and they get to go take that torch and pass it on to the next generations, you know, without pain, without the torture, without all the things that you had to endure as a child because of your courage. So I thank God for you. And I'm so grateful for for this time with you and, and that you took all the time to answer all these amazing questions. And I think everybody that was listening and that was participating in, in my posts on social media for submitting these incredible questions to Nathan, they were really good and stuff that, you know, I haven't thought about asking him either. Um, So I, I thank all of you with all my heart too. you, you know, this, this whole process of podcasting and getting to explore these topics increases my faith every day. Um, and Nathan, I want to open up the floor to you. Is there anything else that you wanted to talk about today that we didn't get to? Yeah, actually, there was one thing we didn't talk about in the like healing episode, I guess, was there's a piece of advice that I had um, from the counselors. Like I talk about David and Donna Carico. They had FOJC radio, FOJC radio. Anyways, they uh, one of the things that they would say was draw what you see inside. You know, I know you've had carry on that we got to do a show with too, but, but, but the expressive power of picking up a pen, like I used a, I'm a terrible, dis- terrible drawing artist. I'll say that, but I would take up a pen. Hold on. I got to find it because it's what we're seeing. I'm not going to show you one of my drawings. <laughs> I want to show you that. Not yet, but I had these like multicolored click pens, right? I love these things anyways, but I would sit there with a piece of paper and just draw what I saw inside. That was one of the best things to help me to analyze what's going on in there. You know what I'm saying? And just something for you guys to consider. Artistic expression, whatever form and variation of it, allows other aspects of you to express themselves in ways that they cannot do necessarily with words, with typing, with communication that's normal. And so I encourage you, those of you that are struggling, those of you that are trying to understand maybe What's going on? Sometimes you just need to pick up an artistic form of expression and use it. It's very beneficial and be willing to do something that's not your normative form of expression. I never color and draw normally, but I'll tell you when I do that, all kinds of other stuff comes out. That's really beneficial. So be willing to step out of your comfort zones and express yourself in a way that's really beneficial for you. Otherwise I like to tinker and make all kinds of other artifacts and all kinds of crazy stuff too. You know what I'm saying? But make knives and get ivory teeth and do all kinds of crazy stuff. Have fun with them. Live dangerously. <laughs> Live dangerously. Amen. Um, I'm discovering that more and more too, that there's a big need to find different ways to express, you know, speaking is one way, but there really is some type of a beauty that, you know, so many survivors have advocated for, whether it is the the actual canvas drawings, like how Carrie does, where it's, you know, actual graphics, whether it's writing in a journal, writing a book, whatever it is, there, there really is that 
the aspect of being able to express yourself in a different way through your hand than, you know, through, through speaking or other channels that we typically would communicate by. So I appreciate you suggesting that. Um, I hope and, and believe that more and more people are turning to that. Um, but it's always good to have that reminder that, you know, if you're stuck doing things one way, there's lots of other ways to, to express, you know, and, and being artistic can, can come about in so many different ways. You know, even I think like singing is such a good way, even if you suck at singing or it's not something that you do, just being able to like express yourself, you know, and use your voice, you know, learning how to use your voice. It, it, that's a beautiful thing too, for people who have just been so uh, internalized for so long, you know, writing, drawing, anything, or taking a bat and slamming it up against a freaking, you know, a uh, giant weight, uh, punching bag, like how Carrie does, you know, there's a lot of different ways that we can take what's inside of us and bring it out into the world somehow, you know, and, and I think that that's really important. Otherwise we're just congested with all this stuff and feel so stuck. So that's an awesome reminder, Nathan. And speaking of reminders, share with everybody where they can find you on social media. Um, and for people listening to you right, right before I let Nathan do this real quick, I know some of you submitted questions about uh, about dumbs and you know un underworld stuff, underground stuff. We are gonna be doing another panel episode, another super soldier Ubermensch panel with Gray, Carrie and Nathan. And that's actually going to be a big part of the topic is sort of the underworld. So I actually saved those questions for those of you asking. Nathan did cover it on an episode a few episodes back during the Q&As where we talked about his specific programming under the, the Delta, uh, Delta programming. So you can go back and listen to that. That was the first question actually on one of the episodes. I think the second one that we did together, the Q&A. So you guys can go look a little bit into that on his channel as well on his YouTube. He covers that a lot. Um, but I did save those questions. We're going to be doing a really deep dive into that. So just be patient with us as we get all these episodes out. So Nathan, tell us where we can find you online. Yeah, you guys can go to snatchedfromtheflames.com. And uh, you can email me at snatchedfromtheflames at protonmail.com. I'm also on YouTube, Yaw Willing, for a good long while, at Nathan Reynolds. And uh, TikTok, it's Snatched from the Flames. Rumble is the Linen Railroad. And uh, you guys can see, I've got my audio book there. I've got my ebook there. You guys can read it for free, download it for free. You can name your own price if you guys want to support it that way. That's awesome. Fantastic. And, uh, you know, we really appreciate everything you're doing here, Emma. Oh, and we got a resource section that's ridiculously awesome of recommended books and reading. <laughs> There's like two or 300 in there. I'm just telling you, have a great time. It yeah. is absolutely ridiculous. You guys will have fun in there. So, so, uh, so I'm going to click um, on that if you want. Yeah. To share it with us this reading, is oh yeah hit the reading resources go back up to that little tab again reading. go to resources a drop down yeah have fun these are some of my just like absolutely favorite i don't have all these books anymore because i some of my things i stash in the mountains y'all are books <laughs> this is how you can wage your war i'm just saying it's information war after the black awakening you're gonna have to tell people what the heck just happened so these are some of the great ways to do that smiley face killers by william ramsey oh that's a good one <laughs> William Ramsey investigates are awesome. Check that guy out. Um, program to kill Franklin cover up child abuse, Satanism and murder in Nebraska. Ooh, these are good. You these are just fantastic. I'm telling you they're, they are some of my best ones. Military mind control by Colin A. Ross cults that kill probing the underworld of occult crime by Larry Kainer. These are just, you all have a great time. These are warfare strategy stuff. There's stuff on homeschooling, education, and tinctures, wild medicines. It's very diverse, just like my family and I are. So it's a it's a good time. You can have a good time. Look, homeschooling. Awesome. Medicines. Oh, my gosh. This is so <laughs> neat. This is amazing that you put this together for us. You guys have to go check this out if you guys haven't. I'm going to actually just link. Uh, I'll have his website, but I'm also going to link the specific page below so you guys can just go click it and find it really easy. He has everything in here. And there was another section underneath that tab too, wasn't there? Resources. Oh, reading. Well, that's the prayer section. Yeah. Yep. For those of you guys, these are incredibly important prayers that made a huge difference for me in my life done by Mary Lou Lake. Um, there's the morning prayer, evening prayers, prayers for trauma, fragmentation, prayers from separation of soul ties and separation from like sexual unions or death. Those would also create soul ties. She's got a prayers on that breaking of generational curses. She's got a section in there for that. And uh, that's the Freemasonry that Isaiah 54.org. That's the link that doesn't work, but I've got the link that works above it. So anyways, those are prayers that are awesome. The prayer for trauma and fragmentation. I can't recommend it enough. Y'all pray that every day. 
challenge you. I'm just saying it made a huge difference in my life. Some other recommended readings. That's awesome. And Nathan does have, like, you can literally get his book online for free. He makes it accessible for everybody. I always recommend if you can purchase the book, please do. It helps Nathan and his family. Um, he does a lot for free for us, including this podcast right now. And, you know, it's important that we help resource him so he can continue to do this and get the equipment that he needs and, uh, you know, have help. Podcasting is actually very time consuming, very expensive in a lot of ways. And uh, the equipment that we need to use is not cheap. So if you guys can support him by purchasing, if not, that's not a problem at all. He offers his book for free and you can listen to it on audio. He has the whole book on his website, also on his YouTube that he reads uh, for you. The audio version is fantastic. I can't recommend that enough. That was a whole different experience for me after physically reading his book through and then going back a second time and listening to him speak it from his heart. You get a really authentic experience and actually get to hear how the story sounded in Nathan's heart and in his head as he was writing the words on his paper, you know, and it's a really uh, different experience than you might get translating those emotions in your own mind uh, as you're reading through it. So I can't recommend that enough. And if you do prefer to read versus listen and uh, you don't want to uh, or can't get the book right now, he offers a PDF. So I can't recommend that enough. He's really gone above and beyond. And all of that too was probably a lot of work. I'm sure so many, so many hours trying to, you know, get all of that deciphered for us in audio and in writing. Um, to put it on paper so we can flow through it. So thank you so much, Nathan, for all of that. Um, we're really blessed that you did all of that and that you're so generous with, with offering this to us. So I'm going to have all of that link below, you guys. I also can't recommend his YouTube enough. He posts all of his interviews on there. He posts so many awesome videos with him and his family. Chelsea's on there a lot. You'll get to see his kiddos and learn a lot of useful things, whether it is the the milling, the live bread, Um that he talks about learning about health, learning about holistic health, and just following his journey. I would love if you guys, if you aren't already, uh, please go over to his channel. I'm going to have all that below too. Go follow him on other platforms. Nathan and I were just talking before we came on about censorship and, you know, we've both been, uh, we've both been flagged on, you know, some of the more popular channels like YouTube and it gets a little bit dicey with knowing if we'll be here tomorrow or not, you know, on these platforms. So the more you guys can go support us on other platforms, even if they're not your usual channels that you watch, be really helpful for you guys to keep in touch with us if something happens and we get kicked off of a platform that you are following us on. So I can't encourage you guys enough. Go to his resource page. If you guys are wondering what, what books to read, just you could spend a whole lifetime reading down that list and maybe knock it through them. So go check all of those books out too and feel free to reach out to him. He's very generous with giving his email and contact information too. So please go keep eyes on Nathan, go support him, lift him up, hype him, share this episode. All of my links are in the show notes to you guys connect with me as well. And I can't thank you guys enough for all that you guys do. We couldn't do this without you. So you guys, thank you so much for being here. God bless you. And we will see you next time.